Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's hearing. Today we're going to hear further evidence from Mr. Stephen Evans of the National Husband Council. So, would you ask Mr. Evans to come in, please? Good morning, Mr. Evans. Good morning. All right, ready to carry on. I am, yes. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Evans. Yes, Mr. Chairman, good morning to you. Good morning, members of the panel. Mr. Evans, good morning to you. Good morning. Uh, we were in the middle uh, of, of discussing uh, the technical guidance note, issue one of June 2015, last night. Can we please have that back up at CEL 402440? <coughs> we were looking at page two, please, option three. And we were discussing, in option three there, the introduction of the phrase, a suitably qualified fire specialist, which, as you accepted yesterday, was a, uh, an amendment uh, from the reference to suitably qualified fire safety engineer that we had in the uh, previous year's version, issue naught. That was the, where we were yesterday. Uh, now, um, you say in your statement uh, that we've seen that you weren't seeking to reduce the criteria for compliance. My question is, did you not realise that by not insisting that desktops were done by a fire safety engineer in order to widen the pool of those eligible to perform them, you were reducing the requisite level of expertise? I didn't consider it that way. Why is that? I saw a suitably qualified fire specialist as being the same as a, uh, a fire engineer. Why the change then? I didn't actually draft this section. It was drafted uh, by, by John Lewis um, and I saw no reason to amend it. I didn't even make, if I'm honest, <coughs> the connection between the, the change. I saw them as, as one and the same. Right. We, we saw in your statement yesterday, and we can go back to it if you like, paragraph 200, page 77, that uh, you say that one of the reasons for the change in the note was, quote, to increase the capacity of suitable engineers to carry out the assessments. So was it not the case then that by downgrading the person from suitably qualified fire safety engineer to suitably qualified fire specialist, you were widening the pool of those eligible to perform them? No. My expectation would be that those option three reports would be done by a, a fire engineer. It's a, a, a looking at the wording, I can see how it could be interpreted the other way, but certainly um, we saw those option three reports being submitted by fire engineers. So why the change? As I said, I didn't draft it and I didn't pick it up when I reviewed it. Ah, you didn't pick it up when you reviewed it? I, I saw them as, as one and the same. I, I didn't think I would. I didn't think there was any difference between the two. Right. Were you not concerned that uh, the people doing these um, desktop studies under option three could come from any uncertified body, or could even be somebody who had gained some kind of fire qualifications, uh, but had no knowledge of large-scale fire testing? I would have taken it that that would have been picked up as part of the review of an option three assessment. Mm. Uh, you said in your statement that the change to the BCI guidance note was to increase the capacity of suitable engineers to carry out the assessments. Do you stand by what you said in your statement or are you changing it? I stand by my statement. Yes, and therefore if the purpose uh, of widening uh, the pool of, of uh, suitable engineers to carry out the assessments uh, was, as you say, were you not concerned that some of them could now come from unqualified or uncertified bodies and had uh, irrelevant quali fire qualifications or minimal qualifications? That would be for the building control body to pick up as part of their review of the option three assessment uh, in ensuring that the report was compiled by a suitably qualified person to do that. Did it not occur to you that broadening the scope or pool of those 
uh, purportedly qualified to carry out these desktop studies w was w making the problem worse in light of the fact that option three reports had been coming in to you that made recommendations without referring to relevant testing? No, it didn't. The fact that we'd actually picked up that these reports were coming in and weren't referring to testing gave me some confidence that we had a robust system in place. Did you consider at the time that the persons actually qualified to do this kind of work were few and did not include those who had no experience uh, of BS8414, the testing methodology and the BR135 criteria, but who might try and enter this apparently quite profitable market? I can't comment on the, the profitability of this. Um, but no, I, again, um, at NHBC, we put in a robust um, escalation process which would have picked uh, those items up when, on the review of the, uh, the assessment. It's right, I think, that after making the change, as we see here, to issue one, or through issue one of the guidance note, the pool of people that completed that work did increase. It did, yes. Mm. And standards fell, didn't they? I can't say that they did. Well, we'll come, come to look at this shortly. The other amendment that's made to the BCA technical guidance note in issue one in June 2015 was to include option four, as you can see now in the middle of your screen. Uh, and that says, if none of the above options are suitable, the client may consider addressing this issue via a holistic fire engineer's approach, taking into account the building geometry, ignition risk, factors restricting fire spread, etc. Such an approach would be expected to follow a recognised design code, such as the BS 7974 application of fire safety engineering principles to the design of buildings, suite of documents, and be supported with quantitative analyses where appropriate. Now, uh, if we go back to your statement, uh, please, at page 64, paragraph 178D at the bottom of the page, you say, option four, which was incorporated into the 2015 BCA guidance note, as explained in more detail at paragraph 193, is based on paragraph 0.30 and 0.31 of the general introduction to approved document B. Let's go to that. That's at CLG uh, 50224, page 15, towards the top of the page. And we can see both of those paragraphs set out there. I, I don't think I need to read them out aloud to you. There they are. That is, I take it, what you were referring to in your statement. It is, yes. Yes. Um, why was that option four only introduced into Technical Guidance Note 18 in June 2015 and not in its original issue, Nought, in June 2014, given that the holistic fire engineered solutions had been one means of compliance uh, with uh, approved document B for uh, a long time? It wasn't omitted from the first issue on purpose. It, it, was, it wasn't there. Um, NHBC, when we'd written to our builder customers, um, highlighting the options that were available in the BCA guidance note, had also added this in as a, as a possible for a, a, a solution, a, a, um, a way of demonstrating compliance for NHBC. Um, and we also started to, or. Um, discussed, I discussed it with the BCA guidance group as a, as a possible um, revision to the BCA guidance note shortly after that. Why not simply refer expressly to what was in ADB, namely paragraph 0.30 and 0.31? Again, we were trying to provide pragmatic guidance to building control teams to um, guide them in um, what, we, what the uh, constituent bodies of the BCA considered were um, acceptable ways for builders to demonstrate compliance. Um, it wasn't meant to be an in-depth technical guide to how to do it. We were relying on the expertise and the professionalism of those building control bodies when doing it. It was a, it was a in many ways, it was a signpost to the different areas of the building regulations um, that could be used to demonstrate compliance. Before including this option four in the guidance note in June 2015, on what occasions had you seen reports produced to BS 7974? I see on my teams and I see lots of reports to BS 7974, fire safety engineering. It's a common practice. I would say almost every um, 
tall building, um, whether it be residential or otherwise, and indeed many um, what you wouldn't term as a tall building, uh, have fire engineered solutions. Uh, purpose built blocks of flats? Yes. Refurbishments of old purpose built blocks of flats? Yes. You'd see how many of those, can you give us an idea that you had seen uh, involving um, combustible materials in external wall build ups before June 2015? So, fire safety engineering does not necessarily look at a single element. That is where option three comes in. Fire safety engineering looks at everything that a building constitutes, so both passive and active fire safety <coughs> measures. Um, so it, it looks at you know, whether, whether the building is sprinkled, whether what the travel distances are within it, what, um, what the facade is, um, how that interacts with different parts of the building. So it, it, appear, it looks at the building as a holistic approach. It, fire safety engineering can be targeted at certain elements or certain functions, but also it, it can take a, a general approach to the fire safety of the whole building. Right. Let me try it slightly differently. Um, as of June 2015, uh, how many uh, holistic fire safety engineered uh, reports to BS 7974 had you seen uh, for either new or refurbished purpose-built blocks of flats involving uh, <coughs> a, a, in, an insulated envelope? I couldn't put a number on it. It wasn't many that specifically addressed the, no. the facade. It was generally for um, means of escape factors. Yeah, uh, and option four reports could only be completed by a specialist field of experts. That's right, isn't it? There's no, def there's no definition for what is a fire engineer. It's not a protected characteristic, such as a, an architect. So <coughs> you could be a fire specialist and still be an expert in fire, up to the standard that you don't have to call yourself a fire engineer, for example, to be registered with the Institute of Fire Engineers. Mm. Did you think it um, important that you should set out the qualifications and experience required to conduct an option four assessment in the same way that you at least attempted to do in relation to option three? Again, the building regulations don't stipulate what level of qualification is needed. It would be for the building control body to judge whether the person that they were receiving that report from um, was of sufficient uh, competence to undertake that. Did the NHBC have any checks and uh, uh, checks and balances on who could undertake that kind of work? No, but we did employ our own fire engineer to review those reports coming in. Was there any discussion internally about what qualifications somebody doing an option four report should have? Not that I can recall. Now, um, can we go please to NHB 401057? NHB 401057. This is an email uh, chain in April 2015. And if we go please uh, to uh, the first email at the bottom of the chain, if we go right to the bottom, uh, we can see that uh, it is your email to Brian Martin on the 2nd of April 2015, copied to Diane Marshall. Graham Perry and Ian Davis. Subject update on combustible materials in the envelope of buildings over 18 metres. Hello, Brian. I hope that you are well. I'm conscious that we have not provided an update on our progress with the manufacturers of combustible insulation materials that are marketed as being suitable for use in buildings over 18 metres for some time. And I must apologise for this, but this has been an extremely complicated process in ensuring that the information we provide to our builders is correct and allows them as much flexibility to demonstrate compliance as is possible. First, what was, can you tell us uh, briefly, what was the extremely complicated process that you're referring to there? I think it was the process we'd been through in the previous 12 months. Right. Mm. Uh, why was this the NHBC trying to allow, quotes, as much flexibility to demonstrate compliance as possible? Why was it doing that? Because we're trying to highlight to builders the routes that they could demonstrate compliance through the building regulations. What flexibility were you allowing that was not otherwise afforded by the guidance in approved document B? There was no more flexibility than was offered in uh, approved document B. Why did the NHBC uh, want flexibility in their building control body? The build, as I explained yesterday, the building regulations allows a builder to demonstrate compliance whichever, they, whichever way they choose. <clears throat> the approved documents give a range of approaches to do that, but a builder can choose other ways if they wish. 
what we were trying to do through um, both through NHBC uh, and through the BCA, so my involvement with the BCA was to um, give building control bodies, point them towards those those methods which you know we would encourage builders if they were trying to demonstrate compliance to use. Right. Was, was, that, was that another way of expressing the concept working with industry? It is, yes. Yes, I see. Uh, now, looking at the third bullet point down on the next page, please, we can, we can scroll to page two, we can see uh, that you refer in the second paragraph there to the, issue, the issued internal guidance, that's issue naught by this point, mm. And then in the third paragraph, uh, you say, with respect to insulation type materials, of which Kingspan K15 and Celotex RS5000 are the most common we encounter, then this would mean following options two and three uh, from the BCA guidance note. Option two, testing of the complete system in accordance with BS8414 part one or two, and then a classification to BR135 issued by the testing house. Option three, desktop study of the system measured against the requirements of BR135 and using results from completed tests to justify reasonings. We have also added a further option of a full fire engineering solution for the complete building and we'll be taking this to the BCA as a suggestion to add to the guidance note. And just on that third bullet point there, we can see Brian Martin's response at the top of the email chain, page one, 7th of April 2015. He says, thanks for this, Steve. If there are common solutions that people are using for the engineered sol approach, I'd be interested to hear about them. It might be that we could adopt them in future editions of the AD. There does seem to have been some confusion in the market, whether some polymer insulation materials are combustible or not. I guess I shouldn't be that surprised, exclamation mark. Anything that you can do to raise awareness has got to be a good thing. Is NHBC content that the existing projects you have dealt with meet these principles? I understood that there had been some questions raised. Were you content that the existing projects that you had dealt with historically had dealt with met the principles being referred to here? I hadn't carried out a review of the existing projects. Did you answer his question? We don't I, see that you did. I don't think that I did, no. No, why is that? Um, I don't know. There was no reason, no specific reason, there was no specific reason to avoid answering it um, or answering the email at all. Well, that may be a matter of opinion, but uh, let me ask you this. Did, did you, uh, you didn't respond to his question, did you ask him about what he meant when he said, I understood that there had been some questions raised. Did you ask I, him? I didn't know. Why is that? I don't know. I didn't respond to the email. Uh, is it because NHBC knew that there was a historic problem and you didn't want to go any further in opening up that problem with Brian Martin. Is that what was happening? No, it's not. Now, we... Uh, I just want to ask you some questions uh, in parallel, chronologically, about LABC. Can we please look at LABC 002817? <clears throat> this takes us just a little bit back in time, Mr Evans, to December 2014. This is an internal LABC email chain, uh, which you won't have seen. The subject is K15RD Urgent. Thanks. Uh, it's an interesting subject title, but it speaks for itself. Uh, it, it is... Um, it, it, let, let me suggest to you that that's a reference to the registered detail for K15, which the LABC had, had published. Now, to paraphrase the email chain, what's happening here is that the LABC is being asked by Kingspan to renew the registered detail, and David Ewing at the LABC is asking for an update on K15 in light of a recent BCA meeting. And you'll remember that the BCA meeting was the one that hap had happened on the 8th of December, at which you and Barry Turner had been present, and we saw the note of that yesterday. So that's the context. Can we look at page one, second email down? This is Doug Basin uh, on, the, on the 11th of December 2014 uh, uh, to David Ewing and Barry Turner. 
And he says, we discussed yesterday, and Steve came clean about the continue to burning discussion we had last Friday. And last Friday, I calculated as, as the 8th of December. They, NHBC, are placing the onus on installers stroke builders who have used it to pr prove compliance where it's not strictly in accordance with the BBA certificate conditions of use. The sales director of Kingspan was apparently very bullish when Steve spoke to him last week and has said the responsibility for how it is used is down to the developer. So they are distancing themselves from it. Not sure if Barry has anything further to add. It seems there's no likelihood of Kingspan coming up with the test that will prove it works in the high-risk situations with combustible constructional details. Cheers, Doug. Now, Steve from the NHBC, uh, I, I'm going to suggest to you, is you. Yes? Yep. Yes. Do you recall this conversation with Doug Basin where you, as he puts it, came clean? As I said yesterday, I can't remember the specifics of the, um, the conversations I had. Do you remember what you had been, as this suggests, keeping from the LABC up to that point? I don't recall I kept anything from the LABC at any point. Was the reference, and I know it's not your email and you didn't see it at the time, but see if you can help. W was there a discussion uh, at, the f at that Friday 8th of December of 2014 meeting about continuing to burn? What was that about? Can you help? The only thing I can think it is referring to is the tests which K Kingspan had done where the, um, the, the test had continued to burn after the, um, the rig had been uh, extinguished. Was that the failed BS8414 test on, an, on K15, in fact, a new form of K15 in March 2014 using the Trespa uh, cladding panel? It could have been, yes. Right. Now, who was the bullish sales director of Kingspan that, that's referred to there? Can you help? <clears throat> I can't remember that. I can't remember his name, sorry. Do you remember what that person said to you? Well, this was at the point where our relationship with, with Kingspan was coming to a, uh, a head and we were running out of patience um, and it was clear that they weren't going to be able to produce the necessary evidence um, and I don't remember the, the exact words but it was along the lines of well we don't put this stuff into buildings, builders do. Um, so that was, the, that was the gist of that conversation. Right. So Kingspan were the people distancing themselves from whatever the it is. Yes. Thank you. Now, um, I just want then to <coughs> um, turn to a new topic, which is the 2015 project review done by NHBC. Uh, it's right, I think, isn't it, that uh, NHBC's change in policy uh, in February or March 2015 led to a review of buildings over 18 metres in which NHBC had in the past provided building control and warranty services? No, the review was to look at con uh, buildings which were under construction at the time. R right. Uh, uh, either way, is this correct, that the review in 2015 um, coincided with or shortly post-dated the um, introduction of the new policy? Yes. Yes. Now, if we go to your statement, please, page, one fifth, um, page 51, paragraph 150, in the middle of page 51, you say this. The Rule 9 request asks about NHBC's combustible cladding review, which is the 2015 project review I've described below. I can confirm this occurred in 2015, not 2014. I coordinated the process. The reason for this was undertaken was to ensure projects where NHBC was providing warranty cover or building control services complied with the policy NHBC adopted in early 2015, as described in paragraphs 106 to 111 above. This process included investigating which projects had products such as K15 and RS5000. Now, you refer there to the combustible, or you refer to the review as the combustible cladding review, but then you mention two forms of insulation, as you can see there. Did that review include all combustible materials in an external wall build-up, such as combustible cladding panels, as well as insulation panels? Yes, it involved um, a team looking at the entire wall makeup. Yeah. Uh, and did that review include all cladding panels, so rain screen, that didn't achieve A1 or A2 classification? At that point, it involved... Um, looking at the whole wall construction and 
uh, giving it a rag rating in terms of if there were any combustible elements within that facade, yes. So the answer is yes, I think. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and what were the parameters in the sense of boundaries of dates used in that review? How far back did it go? So we uh, <coughs> ran a report of all of the projects which were currently under construction or um, were about to start construction. And how were those dates decided? Um, we ran a report uh, on our, uh, our system, uh, which again identified all those projects which were uh, still in progress. Was there uh, a not... calendar start date? No. Right. Now, um, if we go to paragraph 152 of your statement at the bottom of page 51, uh, it says this. The 2015 project review consisted of, A, an internal report was produced to list all the potentially relevant buildings. The fusion system could not categorise by height only number of floors or material, so a long manual review process was, was then required as described below. B, a combustible material review group was set up with four individuals, John Lewis, Philip Pettinger, Gary Jarvis and Dave Alexander-White, working full-time to review the relevant projects. C, I believe they reviewed approximately 300 blocks. In some cases, there were multiple blocks within a single site. And then uh, D, over the page, each project was reviewed in order to confirm whether it had the relevant materials. And then the reviewer anal analysed the project, gave it a red, amber or green rating. Now, just pausing there, uh, the fusion system is the NHBC's IT system, is it? It's our internal document management system, yes, file right. system. Now, without being able to categorise by height, did you therefore categorise by floors, or did you go through each project and check the drawings for heights of buildings? No, we ran, a, we ran the report based on the height of the building, so, sorry, six, uh, six floors, yes. So, so, floors, so, so, so number of floors. Number of floors. Yes, number of floors. Above, so yeah. um, relevant projects were those over six floors? Six floors and above, yes. Six floors and above, equating to 18 metres. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> and what were the relevant materials that you took into account in this review? Everything that was in the external facade. Uh, now, um, when you say 300 blocks, I think you, you covered this yesterday, um, do you mean 300 different projects making up a number of tall buildings, or was it 300 buildings? It was 300 buildings. Buildings. Yes. So that doesn't tell us how many projects... No. Now, continuing um, with um, uh, E, we've seen F. For each of the red and amber projects, NHBC inserted a condition that would prevent final building control approval being given or warranty cover until the builder had demonstrated the appropriate compliance. This compliance consisted of, one, for projects that had commenced before the end of 2013, correspondence with Kingspan confirming that the K-15 can be used over 18 metres in respect of this project... Two, for projects commencing after the start of 2014, compliance with one of the options in the BCA guidance note. G, there was then an escalation process in order to ensure compliance. The builder would submit the appropriate fire safety report or other evidence of compliance. This would initially be reviewed by a fire engineer, generally John Lewis, who would then escalate it to me for further review. I would then finally send it up for final sign-off by a senior manager such as Ian Davis or Diane Marshall. This escalation process was also adopted for pro projects submitted after the 2015 project review. Several examples of this escalation process are described below paragraph 157. Uh, and, and you go on to say, uh, in, on the next page at paragraph 154, you don't need to go there, but the red category meant that the building had combustible insulation or combustible cladding. Yes? Yes. Yes. What if a building had combustible cladding on it um, and where the initial notice was submitted before the end of 2013 but didn't use K15? What was deemed in that case to be appropriate compliance? That would still be... I, would, I, I can't recall if, any, if there were any instances of that, um, <coughs> if I'm honest. Um, but had that been the case, I would still have expected it to be flagged as red because it was looking at the whole facade and for the surveyor to deal with it as they would do the other projects. Did you find any buildings which had combustible cladding on them for which the initial notice was submitted before January 14? Um, by combustible cladding, I mean rain screen panels not achieving A1 or A2 classification. I don't know. You don't know. No. Now, you describe in your statement amber as being medium risk. What was, well, what was deemed to be medium risk? I think I, re I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think I referred to it in my statement as what the categories were. 
Do you know who made the decision uh, about what should be about what the um, ambit of that category was? Yes, uh, John Lewis put forward some suggestions on what those categories should be because I discussed um, how the review should be with with John. <coughs> John put forward some suggestions, and I was happy to accept those. I see. Now, before we go to, on to look at the combustible materials table that was produced from this review of 300 buildings, there were three further colours other than red, amber and green, w w weren't there? There were, yes. And let's just go through those. Yellow, um, that was deemed, I think, wasn't it, to be low risk, so combustible insulation with a brick substrate. Yes. Yes. Um, who decided that that could be low risk? Again, I believe that was uh, suggested during discussions with the, the, the review group. Right. And what was the scientific basis for that, do you know? It was a view that we'd formed as, a, as, as NHBC. I know. But what was the scientific basis for that view? Sorry, can you repeat the, the makeup yes. again? Sorry, yes. What was the scientific basis for that view, that yellow equals low risk, including combustible insulation with a brick substrate? I mean, do you know? I can't recall now the conversations now from off the top of my head now. Sorry. Right. Um, there's also blue, and I think blue is simply not yet reviewed. Not yet commenced, I believe. Not yet commenced. Yes. Yep. And then there was purple, isn't there? Yes. Um, already completed. Yes. Did those feature in the review? No, they weren't reviewed. So if a project or building um, featured combustible cladding or any other combustible material in the external facade, but was completed before the review in 2015, then it would remain as it was with no action taken. Is, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Do you know whether any of those projects classified as purple have been the subject of required remediation in the wake of the Grenfell Tower fire? I don't know. If you um, go, please, to... Uh, page 54 of your statement to look at paragraph 155, you say there that in relation to the projects in the purple band, attributed purple, not being reviewed, you say at uh, 155D, uh, you say in the fourth line, this approach was based on instructions I received at the time. Who gave you those instructions? As I say in my statement, I believe that would have come from either Diane Marshall or Ian Davis. Right. Uh, did you question those instructions? Did you ask either of them what the basis for that instruction was? I didn't, but I believed it had come from uh, the discussions with the, with the NHPC board. Right. Do you know what the reason for the instruction was? I don't know. Uh, Is it not the case that, in fact, otherwise, uh, the job would have been too large? Well, I, I don't know the reason, the decision for it, um, but I have indicated in my statement that, yes, had we, um, you know, from a practical point mm. of view, it took four people seven weeks at full time to review 300 blocks. Yes. Um, I'm not saying that's a factor in why the decision was made not to review existing completed projects. Um, I'm just saying, just explaining here that the, if if we had have been asked to do that, um, that would have been a huge task. But I don't that I hmm. I don't know the reason why that decision was made not to do that. No. Do you know though who actually did the counting exercise to work out before giving you the instruction that it would have created a job so large that it would have been unachievable, as you say in paragraph sub D there. As I say, I don't know the reason why that decision was made, so I don't, I, I can't, I would only be speculating if I said it was purely on the time that it was going to be taken to do it. I see. Can I just understand then, when you say in D, however, as the review of inbuilt projects took four people seven weeks of full-time work, increasing that to cover all the completed buildings would have created a job so large that it would have been unachievable, was that something you knew and, un and understood at the time, or is that you rationalising it when you did your statement? That would be me rationalising when I did my statement. <clears throat> Can we then look at the combustible materials table? I just want to be clear about, about this. First of all, there was a combustible material, materials report, which I think you exhibit as Exhibit 17 to your 
statement, which was put together in 2014, yes? Yes. And there's, there was also, I think, is this right, the combustible materials table, which you exhibit as 101, which was put together in 2015 as a result of the 2015 sorry. review. Sorry, no, 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 sorry. Uh, apologies. No, this was, this was all 2015. Right. But there are, there are two documents, aren't there? There's the combustible materials report and the combustible materials table. The, the report became the table, yes. Right. Let's, let's, let's see how we go with, with that then. Can we go, please, to NHB 50853? <clears throat> oh, sorry. Apologies, sorry. I'm getting mixed up here. Well, that's why I was sorry. Yes, clarification. Sorry. The, the, <laughs> the, I, I imagine when you were talking about the report, you were talking about the original report we ran from Fusion, so the the, um, the Excel table that was pulled out. Sorry, my, my apologies. No, no, this okay. report, yes. No, that's all right. I just want to be to be clear, so I, we know, we all know what we're looking at. So th this is the combustible materials report. Yes. 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 And it it was produced in 2014. It was yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. yes, and it's basically, is this right, a report on how you got to where you were as at late 2014? Yes. Yes. Do you know who drafted this document? Uh, it was drafted by John Lewis. Did you... And, re and reviewed by me. Oh, thank but you. But I, 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 I signed it off, in effect. And who asked John Lewis to draft it? Me. And who asked you to, dra to, to ask him? Um, I believe it... Uh, I believe it would have come up in discussions with Graham uh, Perrier, uh, Diane Marshall, and Mark Jones, because um, we obviously had to, we wanted to escalate it further to uh, our executive committee and then possibly onto the board in terms of making a, a decision on how to proceed. So I can't remember, I didn't receive uh, a specific instruction, please put this report together. Um, it was a decision that was made to put a report together. I, I don't know where the, the, the final instruction came from. Right. And you say you wanted to escalate it further to our executive committee and then possibly onto the board. Well, so can we take it that it was intended, uh, its, its readership was intended to be senior management and the executive board yes, of NHBC. Yes. Now, it focuses, um, correct me if I'm wrong about this, Mr Evans, on K15 and RS5000, but does not include other combustible external wall materials. That's correct. Yes. Do you know why that is? Because the um, the focus of this whole exercise we'd undertaken was on the combustible insulation, um, as I mentioned before, the cladding um, and part of it, although it part of the external wall, we were um, comfortable that that would be looked at as part of the the building control process anyway. Um, so our surveyors would be looking at that. This was um, as as we as we've been through that over the last couple of days. Um, this, uh, the whole process started off here with the confusion over the classification of combustible insulation. I see. Now let's look at the combustible materials table, NHB 403038, please. And we're going to need the native version of this. There it is now. Um, this we have as produced in 2015. Can you tell us the month in 2015? It would have been, I, I can't tell you the exact month now, I'm sorry. It would have been after our change in policy, so around March time. Right, okay. Now, am I right just looking at it that the first tab shows the projects reviewed before December 2013? That's correct, yes. That, that, that was the, the yes. The, the pre-31st December 2013 yes. projects, yeah. yes. And if we scroll down, um, take it from me, that was 196 projects. And we can scroll down and see that. Um, at the very bottom. So, yeah, stop there, 196. Mm -hmm. And I say 196 because, in fact, it's 197, but row one isn't a project. It's the title. And one has to always bear that in mind when reading these Excel spreadsheets. Now, the second tab, if you look at the second tab, um, that's post 010114, yes? Yes. And if, again, we scroll down, we can see that that was 95 projects. You'll see the figure 96 at the bottom in the very far left-hand column. Yes? Yes. Yes. 
Um, was that, and again, that was, that was buildings or was that projects? Um, that was blocks. That was blocks. So, for example, on that page there, row 89, 90, 89, 90 and 91 are all on the same project. Uh, yes. Yes, uh, Royal Wharf, North Woolwich Road, London E16. Yes. Yes. Now, um, the, the third tab is entitled Escalations. Uh, if we go to the top, the third tab uh, is Escalations. You can see that. And there is the Escalations spreadsheet. And that appears to include 143. Uh, must be blocks again, mustn't it? Or is that wrong? That was escalations that came up. So obviously the, the, the table here, um, the pre and the post were at a point in time yes. when we ran the report. The escalations tab was <coughs> added at a later date so we could track the escalations that came through. But these would also include the projects which either hadn't started at that point or new projects which came in after the report was run off. Oh, I see. Yeah. So, so this was more of a tracking sheet rather than just covering those 300 projects. Yeah those 300 blocks, it was then used as a, as a progress sheet for, for running through as well. I see. Um, now, um, just to be clear on my question, again, was this, this block by block? Um, I, I don't know without digging into the detail. I mean, sometimes we would receive uh, an option three report which just covered one block. Sometimes it may cover, right. if they had the same facade on, on three or four of those blocks, right. it may cover all of the scheme as well. Right. Now, um, were these um, uh, projects in, in, encompassing multiple blocks on occasions, those for which the NHBC had either before 2014 not received the letter from Kingspan or after 2014, January 2014, uh, those which had not followed the routes to compliance as set out in BCA's Technical Guidance Note 18, Issue Nought. Sorry, can you rephrase that question? Yes. It was... um, the escalated projects here... Yes. Were these those where, before January 2014, there'd been no Kingspan approval letter, uh, and after 2014, uh, no evidence of following the route to compliance recommended in, t in Technical Guidance Note 18, Issue Nought? It would be both. We required both of them to be escalated. Both those, it, both those, yeah. I see, yeah. And when I say or, it's because there's a distinction, isn't there? Yes. But yes. And what about projects using other combustible materials that had been submitted before January 2014, such as combustible rain screen material? Again, were those just not taken into account? No, again, if the, if the review group had reviewed those, um, so if they were on this report as not being completed at that time, um, they would have been reviewed by the review group, and so the review group looked at all of the, the facade. Of the uh, 143 escalations, whether for buildings or projects, did they all use combustible materials, either cladding or insulation? If they were escalated <laughs> through our process, then yes, they would. Yes, and we've, I think we've seen some examples. Yes. Perhaps we can try one, Mr Evans. Can we go uh, 112? If we scroll down to number 112, um, you'll see there uh, South Thames College, Wandsworth High Street and Garrett Lane, do you see? Uh, and it says, unclear which ACM product has been used. Request CB location and details updated. Cavity barrier is not clear. Uh, and also 120 at the foot of the screen, uh, an address in Glenthorne Road, requested justification of aluminium and polystyrene spandrel panels and CB provision. Now it looks from that, I picked two by, by way of example, that this escalation process, at least, was picking up uh, combustible cladding, or potentially combustible cladding. Yes. Yes. Do you know whether uh, uh, those projects were using ACM with a PE core? If we, if we go back to line <coughs> 112, that comment, unclear which ACM product has been used, um, that is the comment from the, the fire engineer at MK, those initials are Malik Kakoria, right. who was the fire engineer we then employed, we, we um, employed a further um, uh, fire engineer. So they were his initial comments on what was fed through. Right. 
Um, that, as you see, because the, the final columns aren't yet completed. No. Um, <coughs> it hasn't yet been escalated. So they were his initial comments. So they would have been the comments that he fed back to um, the surveyor or the project manager in order to gain that information from the, uh, from the builder. Right. And again, you know, when that was then, um, once that was then confirmed, that would then be then, um, it would be escalated. If it was if it was satisfactory, so it's possible, is it, that he was looking to see whether the ACM there was ACM of the PE core? I'm quite hopeful by seeing that comment that that was what he was trying to establish. Yes, and do you know how it was that NHPC might have provided building control sign-off on projects where the rain screen panels were aluminium composite material with a PE core? At this stage, we wouldn't have done that. You say at this stage. Well, no, well, historically. Saying, yeah, I think historically, I've said, I, I, as we've gone through, I would um, our surveyors would have been um, reviewing the facade, and if they'd picked up that it was a PE core, they shouldn't have. You know, we would have uh, gone back to the builder and you know, gone through our normal building control processes in ensuring that the building complied with the building regulations. Yes, if it was a PE core and been picked up, then should have gone back. Uh, or would have gone back to the builder. That yes. Is, 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 I understand. The question is, did this process identify the fact that in the past, building control officers had been signing off as compliant rain screen panels comprising ACM with a PE core? As I said, we didn't carry out a review of the previous projects. Well, um, that's what I'm asking you. you see, is, there, is this exercise not doing that, at least in respect of ACM? This project was doing this project was doing it for projects which were under construction um, when we took the it from uh, our change in policy. Um, f forgive me, because I thought that this was an escalation exercise which covered both um, new uh, 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 new certifications and, and was, a, was an up to date tracker, but also um, escalations which were escalations from the process covered by the, um, the other documents. My, my apologies. I'm, I'm, yeah. So, yes, we would have asked for... So if, the, if it was a... Um, a <coughs> if it was pre the 31st of December, which is the, the period I believe you're talking about... Yes. Yeah. Um, we would have not only asked for the... Uh, obviously, the, uh, the letter from Kingspan, but we would have also picked up... And, you know, the, the, the cladding panel would have been dealt with as, a, as part of the overall review as well. Yes. So it would have picked that up. Yes, yes thank you. So, so just to be, so that I'm clear with you, the escalations tab here is an escalation not only of post-January 14, but pre-January yes. Yes. 14. Yeah. Yes. Now, was the approach in this table, therefore, to identify any external wall build-ups that had elements in them, whether cladding or insulation, that was not a material of limited combustibility, uh, and had had not been tested uh, under BS eight four one four either part one or two to the BR one three five criteria. If it had been passed through as an escalation, um, it would have yes, it, it would have um, generally been um, a, an option three or an option four assessment. Yes. Um, if it had gone down the, um, the 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 linear routes, option one or option two, I did I thought I saw a, an example earlier on. Um, on one of the earlier tables where um, it wasn't reviewed as part of the review project because it hadn't started, but when they did start, the builder had confirmed that all of the facade was non-combustible, so I'd confirmed back to the uh, project manager that it didn't need to be escalated and they could clear the condition because it, it was an effectively an option one. Yes, I see. Now, the table doesn't indicate how the, the issues were resolved. No. Uh, only that many of them were. Yes. Why is that? Because uh, this confirms that uh, you know, the dates in columns I and J uh, were the dates they were passed through, uh, escalated to me, um, and then when we had or thought we had clearance, um, or sorry, when it had been escalated then on to, to Diane or to Ian for them to clear it. So um, there would then be an, obviously an a chain of emails or escalations that follow this. In what ways did the NHBC um, either downgrade uh, or accept high-risk or red classified projects? So once the builder had provided the information uh, and John or, or Malik latterly um, had um, agreed to those, uh, reviewed the um, submissions from the builder and their fire engineer and was happy with them, they would then be escalated to me. Mm. 
uh, I would do um, <coughs> my management check, um, review it for consistency, review it for obvious errors, um, review it for my understanding, basic understanding of the, of the, of the principles we were looking for. If I ask any questions back if necessary, if I was unclear, uh, if I was unclear on anything, if I was then happy, uh, I would summarise that uh, into a further email and send it on to uh, Diane and Ian, um, predominantly Diane, um, and uh, Diane would then undertake her own review, if it was Diane using this, this example. Um, if she was then happy, she would confirm to me that the combustible materials blocking condition could be clear. <coughs> Right. Uh, I would then confirm back to the, the surveyor or project manager that they could do that. I see. Uh, two, two things arise out of that answer. F f let me just uh, ask you briefly. F first, what information were you referring to there? You say once the builder had provided the information. Yep. Was that a, a desktop? So that would be the, either the desktop assessment, the fire, the fire engineered solution, um, right. and any relevant information that was then needed to... Uh, to demonstrate compliance. I see. And in the escalation process, you've referred to Diane Marshall forming her own view on, based on her own review. Yep. Um, help me. Was Diane Marshall a, a qualified fire engineer? No. What, to, to the best of your knowledge, what f specialist fire qualifications did Diane Marshall have? Experience built up over her uh, career in building control. As a, as a building control professional, you're not necessarily a specialist in all of these areas. You're a generalist. Um, you know how buildings are put together. You have an understanding of how a building works and how the different parts of that building interact. And you're looking at many different things across the building, right the way from the foundations all the way through to fire safety. So our role is to um, have a general understanding. We are then advised by specialists in those areas. Um, and it's up to each building control body um, as an approved inspector, you have to prove that through your licence application that you have either specialist in your organisation or you have access to specialists to advise you. If you're a local authority, then that decision is made by the, the, the head of building control or the chief building control surveyor, how they do that. Um, but you would generally be informed by specialists. That's why we employed people <coughs> like John Lewis and Malik Katkoria to advise us. So they would do the, the fire engineering review using their fire engineering experience the, our internal peer review, if you like, um, and then myself and Diane would look at it from the building control right. perspective. But it was us that were making the decision. That we were informed by um, John and Malik. Um, it was us that was making the, the, so, Diane and myself that were making the decision. Right. So to call it escalation perhaps is misleading in a way. This wasn't escalation. It was uh, NHBC through Diane Marshall and you making a decision. Uh, based on uh, your assessment, your unex inexpert assessment of John Lewis uh, and the other fire John John Malik's uh, expert fire engineering input, it was um, I wouldn't call it inexpert. I was making an informed decision, informed by the experts exactly. that I'm employing to do that for me. Right, yes. but, but let me leave it with you this way, if I can. The escalation process was not a process of peer review of the fire engineering principles and application of expertise underlying John Lewis's own view. No, the peer review was done by John Lewis, is there the, a complete, fire the submissions. Is there a completed version of this table? Um, this was the latest version I, I could find. We, we obviously, when we, um, later in, in 2016, we actually changed the, the policy yeah. um, in terms of the escalations because of the experience we'd gained going through. So th this is, a, is a, a, um, a, a position in time. Now, I want to turn to a slightly different topic, one which we have covered already in your evidence, but I want to view it uh, later in the chronology. In your evidence, particularly in your witness statement at paragraphs 51 to 56, uh, and in the documents we've seen already, um, the, the removal of the clause in buildings with more than with a floor more than 18 metres above, above ground level advice should be sought from the certificate holder. That which was in the original BBA certificate uh, before it was amended in December 2013. Um, you, you say made the product unacceptable for use over 18 metres after that date. It didn't necessarily make it unacceptable. It made it, it couldn't, you know, it, 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 it could still be used if an appropriate, me if appropriate method was used to demonstrate compliance. 
uh, so unacceptable unless it unless it corresponded with options one, two, or three at that point. Yes. Yes. Now, as at December 2013, when the BBA certificate was reissued, <coughs> and that wording, seek advice from the certificate holder, was removed, um, it, it, let me try and leave it with you this way, a letter from Kingspan was no longer sufficient of itself to uh, allow the BCO to bless the use of the product over 18 metres. It would no longer be sufficient for the, um, the building control surveyor to accept that product is complying with its BBA certificate. That's yes. Correct. Now let's go, please, to NHB 50895. This is an email chain from 2015, early in that year. And if we go, please, to page three in the email run, e first email at the bottom of the chain, 27th of January 2015, from Graham Perrier to John Alban at the BBA, copy to you, subject Kingspan Cool Firm K15, BBA certificate 08 slash 452. That, that number is incorrect. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> um, he writes as follows. Hi, John. We're having a few issues with the use of Kingspan Cool Firm K15 insulation on walls over 18 metres and wonder if you would agree to provide me with a bit of information relating to BBA certificate 08-452, which was updated 17th December 2013. The updated certificate contained a slight change of wording in respect of the product's behaviour in relation to fire, which unfortunately changed its suitability for use on facades above 18 metres. The one piece of information I don't have is the reason why the change was made. I've spoken with the certificate holder, but they have suggested I speak with yourselves. Um, are you able to provide me with this information in regards to Grand Perrier? And if we go up the chain, we can see on page two uh, that the next day, 28th of January, John Alban replies, and he says, and this isn't copied to you, uh, we, hi, Graham. We have recently received exactly the same request for information from Mike Quinton to our chief executive. She's asked that I give her the necessary information for Mike. I'll make sure that you're copied in. <clears throat> and then if we go to the top of the chain, uh, we can see that there's an email the same day, 28th of January 2015, uh, from uh, Graham Perrier to, uh, to John Alban. John, copy of current 084582, December 2013, attached. Copy of previous revision 08452, April 2010, attached. I do not have a copy of the original from 2008. The issue related, relates to the revised wording between Section 7 of the 2010 document and Section 8 of the 2013 document. BBA Certificate 084582, dated 27th October 2008, Section 7.2, Contain the wording, and this is in red, in buildings with a floor more than 18 metres above ground level, advice should be sought from the certificate holder. The certificate holder's interpretation <clears throat> was that the BS8414 test was carried out on a masonry wall, and therefore, as long as a non-combustible backing board was used, the wall build-up should perform equally well as the test. NHBC, Building Control and Standards, accepted this interpretation. However, BBA Certificate 08452, dated 17th December 2013, Section 82, Sub 1, contained the revised wording, the test result relates only to this specific construction, and a separate test would be required to establish the performance of any other combination of materials. NHBC Building Control and Standards interpretation of this revision is that only construction subject to satisfactory test in accordance with BS 8414 are now acceptable, which limits use to masonry construction to the exclusion of all other construction types which don't have test evidence, none of which do. Minor change in words, but massive impact regarding acceptability of the non-masonry wall types typically used on high-rise residential developments. It would be most helpful if you could let us know what prompted the revision. Now, the response to that query is at NHB 50898, dated the same day, <coughs> uh, and it's top of page one, from John Albon to Graham Perrior. And what he's doing, he's, he says, as always, thanks for your help with this. As promised, please see below the response given <coughs> by my boss, Brian Moore, to Mike Quinton. And then below that on page two, we can see uh, the email sent by Brian Moore to Mike Quinton at NHBC, 
copy to Claire Curtis Thomas, who, who was the chief executive of the BBA, and John Alban himself. Subject, Kingspan K15. Hello, Mike. Claire has asked me to respond to your query. The certificate in question is for a phenolic insulation board used either in masonry or in conjunction with a cladding finish. In the latter case, the building regulations require that an insulation material should be of limited combustibility if it is, if it is to be used above 18 metres, unless it has successfully passed a full-scale fire test to BS8414 Part 1, 2002. In the previous version of the certificate, we made reference to the relevant sections of the building regulations where this is defined, together with a statement that for buildings more than 18 metres above ground level, advice should be sought from the certificate holder. For the second issue, in December 2013, we were provided with a fire test report to BS8414 Part 1, and we included reference to this in the certificate. We also pointed out that the, this result was specific to the construction tested and that a separate test would be required to allow use of any other build-up above 18 metres. There has been no changes to the building regulations requirements, nor in the scope of our assessment. What we have done is to make the situation clearer to anyone who is not familiar with the relevant requirements. BBA certificates cannot possibly re restate all of the relevant requirements of the building regulations in detail. We can only point the reader to the sections that apply and provide the necessary information on the product's performance to enable them to make an informed decision as to whether or not the proposed specification is fit for purpose, including regulatory compliance. The wording in the previous certificate was not wrong, but it is less explicit than the current version. There has been no change in assessment criteria or scope of approval, only a change of emphasis in the wording. So, in conclusion, it is not correct to say that the certificate was amended in 2013, December 2013 to exclude use above 18 metres. If you need anything more, please let me know. Now, do you agree with what Brian Moore says there, that in, there was in fact no change in the assessment criteria for K15? This is the first time I've seen this email. So I need a little bit more time to read it in depth and, and digest it. So I, um, I can't say whether I, I do or I don't, I'm sorry. Um, as, as I think we've discussed though, our interpretation was there was a change in that certificate. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and I think building on that, uh, if, it was a simple clarification, as Mr. Moore is maintaining there. Um, are you able to explain why NHBC um, w um, used the change in the wording to justify its substantive change in stance in relation to K15? I, mean, I suggest the answer, that you didn't agree with Mr. Moore and thought that it was a change. Well, I think the way we've illustrated <coughs> over the last couple of days, that would be the case. Mm. Now, g given the significance that NHBC says that this change in the certificate had, can you explain why it took over a year, so from late 2013 until January 2015, the date of this email exchange, to seek this clarification from the BBA? I can't know. Can, you can't? I, I, I believe... I, I, I believe we had made um, approaches to them in 2014 um, as we were going through the process with, with Kingspan. Um, I can only suppose why uh, the, the email from Graham then went in January 2015 yeah. as, a, as a final yeah. response. Whether it was asked for as a result of us escalating it up to our senior managers in NHBC and they wanted something a bit further. Certainly, our approaches. No. Our, sorry, our approaches in 2014 would have been at. Um, it wouldn't have been at chief executive level. Obviously, this e this email is to to Mike Quinton. So, um, right. D j just before I move on, then with that, uh, could you just be shown NHB five zero eight nine nine? This is an email from Graham Perrier to Dave White and you. Steve, Dave, please see Brian Moore, BBA response to Mike Quinton below. Not exactly correct, double exclamation mark. Note, this is strictly private at this stage, as it's come to me from John Alban at BBA. No doubt we will receive a request for comment from Mike in due course. And then um, if you scroll down, you can see at the foot of page one, the email from John Alban to Graham Perrier, which I showed you before, 28th of January, which itself forwarded the, the uh, reply from Brian Moore to Mike Quinton. 
at the bottom of page two. So it looks from that email run, Mr Evans, that you did in fact see this email run at the time, including Mr Moore's response to Mr Quinton that I read to you in full. It does, um, but in preparation of my statement, I didn't review that email and I, I can't recall seeing it. I didn't recall seeing it when you showed me it then. At, at all events, um, can you explain why the 12.7 question wasn't also asked of the BBA at the same time? I can't know. I obviously didn't draft the original question to, to John. Were you involved in the decision to go to the BBA and ask them questions at this point, early 2015? I can't remember if I was or I wasn't. It may have been discussed in, when we were um, discussing. Um, so I know in early January we had a meeting um, with Ian Davis and Neil Jefferson, so it may have been an outcome of, of that meeting. Can we then go to NHB 50902? This is an email of the 28th of January 2015 where Mike Quinton forwards the response from Brian Moore, second email down, to Ian Davis and Neil Jefferson. Uh, and in the second email down, <coughs> uh, we, we can see Mike Quinton says, see below from BBA which is the Brian Moore email we've just seen, where does this leave things? Uh, and then if you look at the email at the top of the chain, Ian Davis responds to Mike Quinton, thanks, Mike, it doesn't really help. In essence, it says K15 is only approved for use above 18 litres if it's used in construction types that have been tested. Otherwise, it's not been approved, and we can no longer just rely on the manufacturer's say-so for other types of construction. I forwarded to, forwarded to Graham and Steve Evans, who are following up on the detail. Now, did you accept, after receiving this response, that relying on Kingspan's say-so had been an error on the part of NHBC? No. We, we still had a valid BBA certificate, um, which we'd interpreted uh, and which clearly stated 12.7. Um, so our view hasn't, hadn't changed on our approach that we were going, to, which we were embarking on. What detail were you following up on according to this email? Well, I, I, I specifically don't know. I can't remember an instruction to me to follow up with BBA. My instructions at this time were then to start putting together the, um, the, uh, the review and the um, escalation process. Right. So was, it th was this email run the trigger for uh, creating what we've seen in the spreadsheets, the combustible materials table? No, it wouldn't have been. Um, the combustible materials report we, we saw earlier um, was used to escalate the issue to um, Ian Davis, Neil Jefferson, and I... I um, I assume they also informed Mike Quinton, um, and I understand there was then discussions at the NHBC board, um, which was then that they were the that's that was the trigger for me to undertake starting to a the changing policy, but also then the review. Can I then turn to a different topic, uh, Mr. Chairman? I'd, I'd like to start this topic if I can. I'll get somewhere. Oh yes, you'll get somewhere. Oh, right, yes. Um, uh, I want to ask you next about an email you wrote to Brian Martin on the 15th of June 2015 about clause 12.7, NHB 402792. <clears throat> uh, and uh, if we go please to page four, um, we can see uh, your email to Brian Martin on the 15th uh, of June, at the very foot of page four, and if we go to the very foot, oh, we've missed it. Can we just hold at the foot of page four, please, and see the title? Uh, combustible cladding, that's the title. Now to page five, please, if we scroll to page five. Importance, hi, good afternoon, Brian. Now, before we go through the, the detail of this email, um, just uh, ha have a look down the screen uh, at, um, at what you're saying here. Um, uh, uh, my question is, do you remember writing this email? 
Uh, I didn't write the email. It was drafted for me by John Lewis. I see. Do you remember reviewing it and then yes. sending it? You do. Yes. Uh, what had prompted you to send it? So we'd obviously changed our policy uh, in regard to um, um, combustible, combustible insulation, um, <coughs> and we'd put this blocking condition on. Um, we'd had, and obviously we discussed yesterday, our view that the um, combustible, uh, you reviewed the whole of the facade. Um, when we'd, uh, obviously, I'm putting that condition on to those, uh, con those projects, we had lots of communications in with builders, lots of conversations with builders, and it came up, um, this, uh, the, the anomaly you highlighted yesterday, in terms of the way, one way of interpreting the, the regulations is that you, you could have uh, an external cladding with a classo surface, um, and, but you then had a, a, a non, uh, sorry, uh, a combustible core to that insulation, mm. to that, sorry, to that, uh, to that panel. Um, our interpretation was different, um, and we had been challenged on that um, by uh, some fire engineers. Um, and we, we to, to seal the, uh, they were not terming it as, as filler um, as such. So to settle it, um, I asked John to draft me an email which we could send to Brian to see if we could get a conclusive review, a, a conclusive answer from, from Brian that that <coughs> is what was meant. Right. In that last answer, you referred to a challenge by some fire engineers. Can you yes. remember who they were? Um, I remember one, um, specifically H&H &H Fire, right. at a meeting I was at with a, with a, a builder. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned them yesterday, and yep. we, have, we have some questions, I think, about those. I, I, I know about those, but later on, which we may need to, to cover. But just on this, um, was this email written before or after the issue of the uh, June 2015 issue one of the technical guidance note? I can't specifically, uh, I, I don't know on the date, sorry. Was it written before or after the 2015 combustible cladding review? It, I think they were all happening at the, the same sort of time. Now let's look at the email um, and let's go th through it. Um, you say, good afternoon, Brian. I, I write to request the department's view regarding the need for limited combustibility external cladding finishes on buildings with a floor level exceeding 80 metres in height, assessed in accordance with paragraph 12.7 of approved document B2, together with associated paragraphs 12.5 to 12.9. As I understand it, section 12, paragraph 12.2, explains that there is a need to slow down the rate of fire spread across the external faces of the building, this is elaborated upon in para 12.5, which states that the external envelope of a building should not provide a medium for fire spread if it is likely to be a risk to health and safety, and the use of combustible materials in the cladding system and extensive cavities may present a risk in tall buildings. Generally, a tall block of flats with a defend-in-place policy would be considered a, a high risk to health and safety. At this point, uh, therefore, it is assumed that the entire wall build-up is at issue, and so the following parts of the external wall construction should not assist with fire spread. And then you have five bullet points, the first three of which are external cladding material, backing board, if appropriate, insulation. And there are two others there, intermediate boarding and internal wall linings. And then you continue. However, the wording of para 12.7 of ADB2 then goes on to state that in a building with a story 18 metres or more above ground level, any insulation product, filler material, not including gaskets, sealants and similar, etc., used in the external wall construction should be of limited combustibility. See Appendix A. This restriction does not apply to masonry cavity wall construction that complies with Diagram 34 in Section 9. Whilst this paragraph is clear that insulation products are a risk to fire spread, firstly it's unclear as to the meaning of filler products, and secondly it's unclear whether it's intended that these recommendations apply to the external cladding finishes. The use of the word etc. implies that the major components of the cladding system need to be considered. Whilst many cladding finishes fall within table a, the Table A7 guidance for materials of limited combustibility, we have come across a large number which do not, and so... <clears throat> Even with a class naught surface spread of flame rating and when used with a material of limited combustibility, MOLC, insulation, the objectives of Section 12 may still not be met, even though the guidance in paragraph 12.5 has been met. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and it goes on. Uh, 
Guidance in BS 9991 is more clear, stating that combustible materials should not be used in cladding systems and extensive cavities. See below. However, it also doesn't subsequently state that the cladding finishes should be uh, mulch when used on tall buildings. Uh, and then, um, if you continue to page uh, six, please, BRE 135, fire performance of external walls, etc., is clear that external cladding finish and its interaction with the insulation is an important factor in the resistance to fire spread across external walls. We have met with Dr. Sarah Colwell of BRE, and she verbally confirmed that the issue of fire spread by way of the external finish is as important as fire spread via the insulation. Our own view is that there is a little point in ensuring that an insulation product meets with mulk requirements when it can then be faced with a cladding finish, which, whilst achieving a class naught surface spread of flame requirement, becomes a contributory factor in the spread of fire up the building when acted upon by a flame plume from a flashed over fire. However, there appears to be a difference in interpretation across the industry, and so your opinion, Stroke Steer, would be very welcome. <clears throat> Thank you for your time. Now, first, had you discussed this point with Brian Martin at any time before you wrote that email? Not that I recall. Had you come across colleagues or others in the industry uh, who were confused by the wording of 12.7 and the reference to filler? As I said, I had, we'd been challenged by fire engineers right. uh, on that and point. Had that been recent before this email or, or a, a long time before? I can't recall if it was a long time before or right. whatever, sorry. And what difference in opinion, well, let me ask it this way, in the light of that last answer, when you say that there was a difference in opinion, a difference in interpretation across the industry, uh, was that difference in interpretation about the language uh, of um, this part of ADB itself? It, it was the treatment of the word filler, wasn't it? They, um, uh, and that <coughs> sort of thing. Um, and applying our view, as we discussed yesterday, was that the entire cladding system, if you're, if you're going down option one, should be materials. And even if you're going down other routes, you still shouldn't be using combustible materials in, that, in, the, um, in the facade unless it's justified by another, by another means. To, to your recollection, did Sarah Colwell of the BRE um, support her opinion, as you've referred to there in the penultimate paragraph, by reference to the word filler applicable to the core of a, a panel? As I mentioned yesterday, I don't recall the exact conversation where that was discussed. Uh, right. Uh, so were there fire engineers uh, on both sides of the filler debate, to your recollection? Some thinking no. that filler referred to, for example, the polyethylene core of an ACM panel, and some thinking that it didn't. I would say yes, there was, because I had a fire engineer, John, John Lewis, who was on one side and I had discussions with... Um, at least one fire engineer who was on the other. What side was John Lewis on? He was of the same view as me that it, 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 he drafted this email, so which is clear that we thought it should um, the the non combustible element was for the entire cladding system. But was that because of the word filler, or just because that was best practice? I think it was go you go back to paragraph twelve point five. You, you start. You, they should all be read together. It's very different. It's very. It, it's very. When you're reading the building regulations, they're not. They're not into, you have to read lots of different parts together and put, and put it together to form a picture. Mm. Um, so, you know, as they say, you know, we've referred to four or five different clauses within that specific section of the building regulation. So taking it all together, that was our view. Um, that I follow. The, 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 but very often the debate that was thrown back, if you're not thrown back, but the, the debate that back, the point of view that was put back to us by um, those fire engineers would be that... Um, 12.7 mentions filler, and filler doesn't include the filling of a, a bit in an ACM panel or in any other panel for that, the, the cladding panel. Uh, so, was your opinion that filler did refer to the polyethylene core of an ACM panel? I had no particular view on what filler meant, but the fact that these fire engineers <coughs> had uh, used that as a reason for not necessarily asking for the the core of a panel to be a material of limited combustibility, that was where we wanted to um, actually fill it, you know, um, to actually get a definitive view if we could. Yes, I see. Now, you wanted a definitive view from Brian Martin? Yes. He would, he would be the person I would, if I had a question on the building regulations, uh, I would go to. And did you go to him because you expected him to give you a definitive answer?
Sometimes Brian would give you a view, sometimes he wouldn't. But the department was always um, was always keen, would not necessarily come down on a on a, um, a yes or no unless it was really clear in the document. Uh, answers were, you know, as far as the department was concerned, it was for the building control body to make a decision. And as you'll see, they they would point you in the right direction, but they wouldn't necessarily give you a, a yes or no answer. But on this one, uh, uh, what did you uh, what did you ask? I was, for I was trying to encourage a yes or no answer. Yes, thank you. Now, um, uh, you said that you'd come across a large number of cladding finishes that were not materials of limited combustibility. When you say large number, can you give us an idea of the scale? I can't know. No. Was that in relation to projects on which NHBC were providing services? It would have been from my experience, yes. And was that as a result of the review of combustible materials that you had conducted up to this point? It would have been informed by that, yes. Mr Chairman, is that a convenient moment? Yes, I think it is. Thank you. Well, I think it's time we had a break this morning, Mr Evans. We'll stop now. We'll resume at 25 to 12, please. <coughs> and as usual, please don't talk to anyone about your evidence. Thank you. The rest of the room. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Millett. 25 to 12, please.
Would you ask Mr Evans to come back in, please? <coughs> All right, Mr Evans, ready to carry on? I am, yes. Thank you very much. Yes, yes Mr. Uh, Mr Evans, um, continuing with this question of all elements, and I want just to... Um, go quickly through some old ground, over some old ground. So um, let's take this quickly. I think we can. Um, looking at the issue naught of Technical Guidance Note 18 again, that's at NHB, triple, quad, um, NHB 50760, page 2, option 1. We can see the lim linear route there. And as we looked at on the first day of your evidence, the reference there is to use of materials of limited combustive for all elements of the cladding system, both above and below 18 metres, yes? Yes. Now, um, I, this will, th I'm sure you will accept that that is crystal clear. To me, yes. Uh, well, why would it be not crystal clear to anybody? I, I'm agreeing. Yes, I, I, you're I agreeing vigorously. The question, the question was to me. Vigorous agreement. Yes. Um, was it clear to you at the time this was drafted and issued uh, that g the guidance in ADB relating to limited combustibility did apply to all elements of the cladding system? My view was that it did, yes. Yes, I mean, and can we proceed on the assumption that your view was an NHBC view? Yes. And, and that that included the external cladding finishes? Yes. As you described them, or as described here, the external facing material? Yes. Um, now, given that, can you just tell us what, has made, what had made the matter unclear to you after that uh, by the time you sent this email that we've just seen to Brian Martin in June 2015, it was the challenge around it was the challenge around the, the meaning of the word filler. That was the um, you know, the, the the feedback from right. engineers when we were having conversations. So it, was, it's, it wasn't unclear in my mind. No. It was just there was an, it was unclear in terms of there wasn't a clear. I couldn't counter it with an, uh, at that point with an argument. It was just my interpretation back to the, I to the builders. Yeah. I follow. So com does, it, does it come to this that the NHBC, having heard the counter-arguments, wasn't persuaded by them, but had identified a controversy in the industry which you thought government should solve? Yes. I think I came back from one meeting and, and played, tried to play <coughs> devil's advocate with, uh, with John um, to, see, uh, to, to challenge, to challenge that his view and my view. Um, but I was... I was firmly the view that, yes, it should be all elements. And was Sarah Colwell's confirmation to you on the 27th of November 2014 at the meeting along the same lines a comfort to you? It, it, would, it would have been, yes. 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 Now, um, if we then uh, go to the response to the email, we have that at NHB 402792. 402792. This is Brian Martin's response the next day, 16th of June 2015, uh, at um, page four, please, in this email run. And if we go to that, he says this. Hi, Steve. I can't offer a formal view as such. Specific projects are a matter for the relevant building control body. As you say, the overarching objective is that the external envelope of a building should not provide a medium for fire spread, and this is particularly important for a block of flats. People do sometimes try to play games with the definitions, and where this happens, one should refer back to this objective... We came across one incident where an EPS foam was used to fill a void behind some aluminium sheeting. Because it was not included specifically for its thermal properties, the designers had concluded that it wasn't insulation and thus its use was OK. When it caught fire, the flames could be seen across the city. That's why the reference to fillers, etc., was included in the AD text. Do you have some examples of specific constructions you've come across? It may be that we could revise the text again or maybe test some of it. Now, what did you understand Brian Martin's role to be relating to the wording of ADB? My view that he was effectively the guardian of ADB. Did you understand, therefore, why his response was that he couldn't offer a formal view as such, as he says? Things, as I explained before, the department would not necessarily always come down with a, with a definitive view. Um, they maintained that they've uh, that they, the approved documents were then for the um, <coughs> relevant building control body to use in terms of making their decision whether they were happy to accept um, builders' um, evidence of compliance. Uh, if the department's building regulations 
division in the shape of Brian Martin could not offer, or perhaps would not, offer a formal view on the wording or the meaning of a particular provision in ADB, do you know of another organisation or individual who could do so or would be prepared to do so? Or who is responsible for doing so? As Brian says there, it is for each relevant building control body. So on each individual project, it would be for that building control body to make a decision if a question came up on what was a filler or not. Um, if there was if there wasn't a specific definition um, in terms of who should be making that definition my view because I asked the question was that it should be um, MHCLG um, did you understand in light of that answer that what Brian Martin was saying was that interpretation of the guidance in approved document B interpretation of it and its language was a matter for the relevant building control body Interpretation is, um, but if those, um, if ultimately um, that still is in dispute, um, there's the, there is then the, the the formal enforcement route to go down, which would ultimately end up in the courts for the courts to make a decision. Mm. Just putting the point another way, did you understand Brian Martin to be saying that interpretation of the language of approved document B was up to each individual building control officer? I think Brian here, the way I, I interpret this body, yes, he's saying that <coughs> it's up to each individual building control body, but I also think that the, by including his third paragraph there, he was pointing very much, trying to, to give a, um, a signpost to why filler was in, included as a word. So almost to, not necessarily to as say, he can't offer a formal view, but he was certainly trying to signpost what he interpreted that filler to mean. Right. Uh, and in the third paragraph, he, 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 well, what did you understand by uh, the, the, the email as a whole and specifically the third paragraph? He was pointing towards um, a material which wasn't, hadn't been included as an insulation. As being, uh, it wasn't included in the wall as, as, for its um, thermal properties as that. So um, I didn't, my, my interpretation of that was you know, just saying it's not an insulation, it's, that, that layer is not an insulation. Hmm does not mean it's not a filler. A bit oblique, isn't it? It, it is. It is. Um, and I think, as I say, uh, my, my conclusion from this email is we hadn't got an answer. No. And as we'll, we'll see in a second. Before I ask you about that, did you know which project Brian Martin was referring to in his email in the third paragraph there? I, I didn't know. No. Right. Does the fire at uh, the edge in Salford in January 2005 mean anything to you? I've heard it during the course of the, um, the, the conversations here, yes. Oh, I see. Now, if we go back to the email chain and go to page three, please, we can see that on the 17th of June 2015, uh, you um, uh, forward this email and Brian Martin's response to your email to John Lewis, uh, and you say this, <clears throat> John, not a very clear answer, indeed not an answer at all. In, in the light of that, Mr Evans, did you consider going back to Brian Martin and asking for a clearer answer, or an answer, on this question? No. Why is that? I felt I'd got uh, the answer that Brian wanted to give. Yes, um, but given its obliqueness, why didn't you go back to him and say, words to the effect of, come on, Brian, uh, don't haver, give us a view. You're the only person who can give us an authoritative view. Why didn't you do that? Because it didn't change our view on the fact that the, um, the entire cladding system should be materials of limited combustibility when going down that route. Did it give you enough material to go back to those uh, fire engineers that you referred to, for example, H&H, &H, and say, well, we've now got a sufficiently clear answer from government uh, that a polyethylene core of an ACM panel, uh, because it's filler, uh, needs to be, well, is out because it's not a material of limited combustibility, and that the rain screen panel itself must be a material of limited combustibility throughout. It, it didn't give us that ammunition, though. No. no. So given that that's what you wanted by asking him in your email 
for a view, why didn't you go back to him and say, I'm sorry, Brian, this isn't enough for me to resolve the controversy? At this point, we were in the middle of doing a, a review of all of those projects where I was extremely busy. Um, I'd tried to get an answer from Brian. I hadn't got the answer I wanted. We were happy with our interpretation of the regulations and proceeded on that basis. Right. Um, now, let's uh, see how this eventuates within uh, NHBC. Can we go up, please, to page two in the email chain, where we see John Lewis's response to you the same day? Uh, and he says, yes, a clearer answer would have helped. However, interpreting his response, can I suggest, one, filler materials have been made a bit more clear. A plywood backing to a metal finish would, I guess, be one such example. Actually, it's quite useful to know now what the definition of a filler material is. Brian says that uh, the overarching objective is that the external envelope of a building should not provide a medium for fire spread, and that if in doubt, we should refer back to this objective. So surely it has to include the external cladding material, a question mark, an example being that we'd be reluctant to accept timber cladding, which only has a class naught SSOF, surface spread or flame, but which would allow flame spread when acted upon by a large flame plume. Is this enough for us to hang our hat on? Question mark. Should we let H and H play devil's advocate on it? Question. They're usually quite good at arguing these things. Exclamation mark. <clears throat> had there been a specific situation in which the two of you you and John Lewis had discussed whether the definition of filler applied. I think, as I mentioned before, uh, after a meeting with H and H, I'd come back and played devil's advocate with with John to test out what we thought. I see, and therefore his suggestion should we let H and H play devil's advocate was passing the ball back into their court to see how they argued it. If they wanted to continue arguing it, yeah, right. Uh, how did you understand what John Lewis meant by "is that enough for us to hang our hat on"? i.e. his interpretation of what um, Brian was saying, was that enough for us to, to keep on with our definition, or our, our interpretation, sorry. Now, in your statement, you refer to, to the fact that his reference to H&H &H playing devil's advocate was a reference to H&H, &H, a fire engineer who would act on behalf of builders on various projects. That's what you say yes. at paragraph 287E, little Roman 7 on page 116. And you go on to say it would try to push the interpretation that the ACM core was neither filler nor insulation. On what occasion had H&H &H tried to argue that the core of an ACM panel was neither filler nor insulation? Uh, in my statement, I mentioned a building I had with uh, Barrett East London, where H&H &H were present. So it's on that project? Yes. And, and for the, to the best of your recollection, was that debate before or after the issue of issue naught of technical guidance note 18 in June 2014, which referred to all elements. It was after that. It was after that. Yes. <clears throat> Did it date? It, it was. It, pre, it postdated um, the um, the review where we then applied the condition. That was a, a reason for having right. the, the the meeting. We'd, we'd put a condition on the um, particular project, which meant it could be finaled for warranty or building control without uh, the necessary justification being submitted. Did you have a discussion with H&H &H about the, the terms of your option one, which referred to all elements and external, external finishes? And as, say, I as I recall, on this project, it was actually using a combustible insulation. Um, so there was the justification there, but then they, were, they also had a, um, there was also then obviously discussions about the panel as well. Did H&H &H, uh, argue with you that technical guidance at note 18 issue not went too far in requiring all elements of the external wall construction to be materials of limited combustibility, including the external panels? As I recall the discussion, they were relaying their interpretation of approved document B to me. Um, I don't believe the specific um, challenge was around the content of uh, BCA guidance at 18. It was around how we made, how they were able <coughs> to um, demonstrate compliance with this particular project. Right. And who was it at H&H? At &H? Who was the engineer who took that view? I can't remember the gentleman's name. Was he called Glenn Horton? It wasn't Glenn, though. No. It wasn't Glenn. No. Um, do you know whether H&H &H had submitted an option three report, desktop study, or an option four holistic, uh, holistic engineered solution uh, in respect of that uh, project? Or were they making these points based on an interpretation of the linear route in 12.6 to 12.9 of ADB? 
as I mentioned, this uh, I, my my recollection was that this project also had material. Uh, sorry, had um, um, uh, combustible insulation. Yeah. So it would have been it would have been necessary to go down the option three or the option four route. Yes, my question is, is did, had they submitted a report? I, I can't recall at this stage. Had they, um, I don't think at this stage they had submitted a report. This was a a, pro, a, a meeting on an ongoing project on a, on a project which was going through the the design stage. Now we saw that Brian Martin asked in his email for you to respond with specific constructions that you'd come across. Uh, now I, we we can't because of the redaction, see the end of this email chain. But did, did you respond to that request from Brian Martin? I don't think I did. Why is that? As I said, at the time, <laughs> I hadn't got the answer. an answer. Um, I moved on to the next, the next problem, which was in front of us on that day. Was it the case that you had been approving combustible cladding materials on buildings and didn't want to tell him? No. Do you know why Brian Martin's interpretation was regarded as... Uh, unhelpful? Or was it just its lack of clarity and commitment? To me, it was that lack of clarity, yes. Right. Can I then turn to something different? Um, and this is 2016. Uh, do you remember that on the 13th of January 2016, you attended a conference hosted jointly by the BRE and Siderize? Yes. Do you remember that you gave a presentation at that conference entitled Facades to Tall Buildings, Routes to Compliance? I do, yes. Do you remember that there was a question and answer session at the conference? Uh, at the time of preparing my statement, I <coughs> remembered there was a Q&A session, but I couldn't remember the specifics that were asked at that time. Now, uh, I, I'm going to show you a video of this conference, or part of it, uh, which uh, lasts about seven minutes. Mr Chairman, I hope that's not inconvenient. We also have a transcript of it at INQ 3014949. Um, it, I, it is just as quick to, go th to, to listen to the video as it is to look at the uh, transcript. <coughs> so I'm going to ask for the, for the video to be played. Right, now, does it contain anything of which people should be warned? Well, on on only words, no fire. And there's no graphics or images in it. All right, thank you. Um, yes. Um, it's at SIL, SIL 000 And I'd like the, um, the, cur the cursor al along the bottom, please, to be put at 12 minutes exactly uh, and to, to stop at 19 minutes and 13 seconds. Uh, and I'd like you just to follow along with me. Uh, as I say, we have a transcript as well, which we can go back to but I'd just like to show it to you. Because, and the reason I'm showing you the video, I should just be clear, is, th is that we get a very clear impression of the interaction at this conference. Can we start, please, at 12 minutes? I have the volume up. Uh, good morning. Nick from Euroclad in Booth Murray. We're a manufacturer, uh, a fabricator of um, ACP, or aluminum composite <coughs> material um, facades. We, we fabricate all manufacturers' um, materials, so typically there'll be a Lucabond, Alpolic, Larsen, and, and many others. Now, typically ACM is available in three grades in the UK, and all three grades are commonly supplied in the UK. One grade having the polyethylene core, which was used on the fire that we saw the video of, it burns very aggressively, the polyethylene, <laughs> as has been discussed. Interestingly, all three grades achieve a class O in terms of surface spread of fire. Um, Aluka Bond and Mitsubishi have two levels of then fire rated materials, one achieving a, a, um, a B classification under the, the Euronorm test and one achieving an A2 classification under the Euronorm test. I think there's a lot of ambiguity at the moment as to what is acceptable as being non-combustible and does the B classification S1 DO sit within the require or the limits of what is considered of limited combustibility or does it have to be A2? If it's of A2, then 
it's of a concern because in the past 15 years, we've only supplied two projects where the A2 grade material has been used. So we, we talk about substitution of materials. There's a real concern there that actually perhaps none of the materials supplied in the UK, with the exception of two projects to my knowledge, actually meet the requirements of the definition of limited combustibility. So your question, we, right, the question is, is whether a Euro Class B is limited combustibility? Yeah, BS1DO. That is not. That is not limited not. combustibility. Uh, in that, which case, you only have two projects. The, the other thing to remember is approved document B is not the regulation. Approved document B is guidance. And that there are other means to demonstrate um, compliance with the building regs other than approved document B. But what I would say is if you take approved document B as the absolute requirement, which I've caveated, then it, it's limited combustibility for buildings with a storey above 18 metres. The, I mean, in, in, in view of what the gentleman was outlining there, does the panel feel that um, potentially we are sitting on a time bomb as well in terms of some of the, uh, the materials that, that are installed, or do we have a level of confidence that the ones that have been installed in the past um, will perform in a fire? Anyone want to come back on that one? We have to ask our builder customers. <laughs> <coughs> uh, taking that, the, the polyethylene type panel, yes. obviously if the, if, the, if the building has, doesn't have a habitable floor over 18 metres, uh, there's no restriction uh, on that. I, I understand that, so but that I could used. name but over 18 tens metres, of projects. I mean, have it is a, there's an, there is an anomaly <laughs> in the, um, the approved documents. You know, if, you, if you follow the guidance within the approved documents, you are deemed to have met the performance criteria. Okay. So the, the approved documents, if you follow the elemental method, if you use a non-combustible <coughs> insulation material uh, and your external cladding meets diagram 40, which is a class O surface spread of flame, you're deemed to have complied. So there could be instances, could be, uh, where we have this polyethylene filled panel on buildings over 18 metres. But the, the, when we talk to DC, we have highlighted this with DCLG, uh, and they are looking at Part B at the moment in terms of looking at other areas of the regulations they need to, to examine, and Part B is one of those. We've, we've submitted evidence to say, well, actually, this, this is something we've found, the spoon troll industry. Um, the th when you talk to them, is it, it, you know, yes, you've got a combust what, it, what could be a combustible cla uh, cladding, external cladding, but if you then couple that with an, a combustible or... Um, an insulation material which is not material in combustibility, actually you're increasing the risk as well. So that's the, when they developed these regulations after the 1999 fire, um, that was where that came from. Um, but like all regulations, it's, you know, they uh, continually evolve. Um, when regulations change, we don't revisit older buildings, which perhaps if they were built now, wouldn't comply. Mm. So we don't do that. So, you know, there are a number of areas of the building regulations where there, there could be buildings out there which wouldn't comply with modern day standards, but those risks are managed, aren't they? So, to, so to be clear, if you have a non-combustible insulation, a mineral, a mineral wool insulation of, of one brand or another, yep. in conjunction with an, uh, a classification of external cladding that has a class O surface spread of fire, yep. that is acceptable it, under the current regs. It, meets, it would meet the boom regulations, but as your building control body, I would perhaps be talking to you in light of the, my knowledge, because my knowledge is not about yeah, it's minimum levels of the compliance building regulations, um, but we as an industry should be talking to our customers about that as well, and we should be talking to um, government about that. Yeah, my personal my view is that that certainly should change because yep. it's, it, you could have exactly, in that scenario, you could have an exact repeat of the Dubai yep. fire in any number of buildings that we supply product to in London. And to boot, many of those will also have a foam-based thermal insulation. Yeah. And again, the, the panels when they're manufactured, uh, the, you know, again, factory, factory manufactured panels are probably safer than the, you know, have a, have a lesser degree of risk than the, um, the, the ones that are manufactured on site. But what you find is invariably uh, with building tolerances, even with factory 
made panels that can complete fully sealed, the core is fully sealed and things like that. So you have some degree of time before that fire reaches that. Which is that they, they, they have to be cut to size and all sorts and altered on site anyway because of building tolerances and the, and the way that that happens. So that again increases the, the risk. Yeah. And, and even a factory made panel yeah. has exposed edges oh, in, yeah. in aluminium yeah. composite material. Yeah. It is something we've raised uh, as the Building Trial Alliance, we have raised with DCLG as an area we think should be looked at as part of their review of Part B. Thank you. That's, uh, that's all we need. <clears throat> now, uh, I've shown you that uh, clip. We can go back and look at the transcript if we need to. Uh, it, it's clear from that, and would you agree, that Nick Jenkins of Booth Murray was very worried about the use of ACM with a PE core. He was. Uh, 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 and was worried because it was widespread throughout at least England and Wales, if not the United Kingdom. It was widespread on the, the project. He, he alleged it was widespread on the projects he'd been involved with, yes. He wouldn't be the only supplier of aluminium panels in the industry. Mm. No. Were you surprised to hear from a manufacturer of ACM panels that they were predominantly supplying ACM panels with a PE core to builders rather than those of limited combustibility? He didn't define what buildings they were that he was providing those panels on, as I, as I explained in, the, in, the, uh, in my answer. Below 18 metres, there was no restriction. Mm. Were you not troubled to hear that in 15 years, Booth Murray had only supplied two projects with A2 panels, i.e. materials of limited combustibility? Again, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't, I'm not part of that time to the, how, or I still don't know, understand how many buildings he's provided those on. Now, the chair of the panel directs a question to you as to whether we're all sitting on a ticking time bomb. Uh, and your first remark was, you'll have to ask our builder customers. Hmm. Why, why did you respond in that way? Because I haven't been involved in all of the buildings that have been built in the UK. Surely the NHBC of all groups or in, I, I, institutions would be the best place to answer that question because it was providing building control services and warranty services to most of the industry. It was providing warranty and building control services to a proportion of the industry, yes. A large we, proportion. A, a large proportion, but again, um, we, don't just build, we don't just do provide building control and uh, warranty on tall buildings. We also, uh, the, the vast majority of the buildings we work on are uh, less than 18 metres. Yes, I understand that. But where it's over 18 metres, why would your remark, you will have to ask our customers, our builder customers, apply? Because they know what they've built. Yes, but you had the overview, didn't you, R rather than your customers who only knew what they'd built? Yes, we, um, as a building control body, we're not on site all of the time. Um, and it, but it's, it is the builders that are there all the time. They know what they have built. Um, there are things such as project, substi uh, product substitution, um, those sort of things that... that you know, we may not be made aware of. Well, are you saying that the NHBC was, was not aware of what its builder customers had built and what uh, NHBC's BCS had signed off on? As I, as I said, as I said over the last couple of days, our building control um, processes would um, have picked this up on the buildings we were providing building control on. I was speaking there, I was there at that... Um, that conference representing the BCA, not NHBC, the BCA. So speaking on behalf of the BCA. Right. Well, you were wearing an NHBC badge. Did you not see that? I did. Would most people there know you as an NHBC person and think that when you spoke, you spoke at least consistently with NHBC's views? I was frequently introduced at these seminars as Steve Evans from the NHBC. Yeah. Well, that was another yes. question, but exactly so. So, I mean, isn't the NHBC the largest insurer and building control body in the United Kingdom housing market the best person, best institution to be able to advise industry on the safety of the current housing stock? That's not our role. No, but it, it is your role to have a view about fire safety in the, in the built environment, is it not? NHBC's role is as a, uh, a provider of housing warranties to new, home, to new homes, mm -hmm and as a, an approved inspector. Hmm. Uh, and we, we don't, NHBC are not a regulator of the industry. NHBC do not make the building regulations. 
Um, so that is not our role. No, and um, perhaps we're at cross purposes. Um, when the suggestion was made, we're sitting on a ticking time bomb, I'm just interested in, to know why your remark was we'll have to ask our builder customers rather than expressing a view, whether it's the BCA's view or NHBC's view. Why did you shunt it off as something for the builder rather than something for the builder's insurer or the building control officer? I'm not, so NHBC is not the builder's insurer. NHBC provides housing, 10 year housing warranties for new homes. We don't insure builders. Um, Sorry, I, I said actually it's gone wrong in the transcript. Building insurer. You provide warranties? Yes, yes. For, for new homes. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, can you repeat the question? I think we've, we've, we've yes, lost uh, track each other's track. Very well. Uh, let, let's back up a little bit. This, this conference was about tall buildings, facades yes. on tall buildings. Yes. So we, can we forget low builds, mm -hmm. anything under 18 metres? Mm -hmm. Right, so in that context, which is of course the context in, in which this conference is taking place, and the context of Mr Jenkins's questions, when the question is, are we sitting on a ticking time bomb, and you say you'll have to ask our builder customers, what I'm suggesting to you is that that was uh, shuffling off responsibility for answering the question onto your customers in circumstances where NHBC, or the BCA if you like, was at least as well placed to answer it. Do you accept that? No, our builders build, build, the builders build the buildings. They know what they, they should know what they've built. Um, we don't, as a building control body, as, as an HPC, we don't hold as built drawings for those buildings. Did you disagree that industry was sitting on a ticking time bomb? I didn't have a view in terms of that. I, I couldn't make a, uh, a call on that. That's not my place to do. Uh, being a little bit more scientific, uh, you, we've seen the discussion that you uh, in, involved in, uh, that you got involved in about an anomaly in the approved document. I think you've, earlier in your evidence, described a little bit of that. Uh, uh, just so that we're clear, is the anomaly that diagram 40 of approved document B allows cladding that is class naught surface spread of flame to be used over 18 metres, uh, and that even if the, that cladding is not a material of limited combustibility, you are deemed to have complied with the building regulations. That is the view that was expressed, that we discussed earlier with the H&H, &H, yes. Yeah, yes, that's the anomaly, is it? That is, yes. Yeah. Yes. And in that situation, can you explain why you were deemed to have complied? A view would be, if you went down that route, that you were deemed to have complied. Uh, but that wasn't your understanding or um, view of approved document B in 2016, was it? It wasn't my view, no, no. Uh, and indeed, that view was inconsistent with technical guidance note 18, wasn't it? It was. Mm. And I think, um, had there also been a video of my presentation, which I gave, which led into that, I bear, in, in, my, um, in my talk around that presentation, I highlight that it is our view that it is all of the cladding system. Uh, and is, that's, that is because, I think, isn't it, that the, your view is that the external cladding had to comply with both diagram 40 and the requirements of... Uh, 12.7. Yeah, you, you can't take the independent parts together. You have to read it all, all of that read, section together. You have to read it all together yes. so that the, all, all the materials in the external wall should be of limited combustibility. Yes, and if, if all else fails, you go back to the actual regulation itself rather than the guidance, which would be regulation B41. Now, that being your understanding, did the NHBC permit the use of ACM PE on, on that basis? As I've said before, no, we did not. No. So if a builder came to you saying that they had complied with diagram 40 of ADB because their panel was class B, for example, uh, it being an ACM panel with a PE core, would the NHBC building control services have signed off the project as compliant? I would hope that, I, I can't speak for every individual project, um, because, of course, I wasn't involved in every individual project, but our surveyors um, should have been picking that up, yes. Right. So uh, the answer is... The answer is... Uh, uh, not to my knowledge. Not to your knowledge, right. Now, we've been through 12.7 of ADB in your email to Brian Martin uh, in June 2015. 
we saw that, that's six months before this conference. Uh, as at January 2016, had your understanding that we've just explained and you've just explained changed as to what materials 12.7 applied to? No, it hadn't. So you, 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 was your understanding that it did or was your understanding that it didn't apply to, to external cladding? My, my understanding, and I, as I was trying to express in this answer, and it, it's perhaps not the clearest of answers, um, was I was agreeing with, with um, I forget the person's name now, sorry, Scott. Um, I was agreeing in terms of the, 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 the interpretation in the, in the regulations, um, but I then went on to express if I was your building control body, and I think I was cut off at that point, uh, or went off on, on another tangent. Um, but as I said, I, I felt I, at that conference I'd expressed. Um, so in preparing my statement, I wasn't aware of that, that video. It's only as, as a result of reading other um, evidence that's been forwarded to the inquiry. Right. Um, and I reviewed that. I could have perhaps put it better in terms of my view uh, and what I felt the, the view of the industry should be on that. Um, but as I say, I, it hadn't changed my view. My view has always been um, that the cladding panels should be um, should to go down the option one route should be a material of limited combustibility. All of the panel. Yeah, yes. And why didn't you tell that audience in January 2016 what you're telling the same audience, in a sense, in the first BCA guidance note in June 2014, namely uh, that uh, as one of the elements of the cladding system, a cladding panel with a PE core uh, wasn't allowed because it didn't meet the requirements of limited combustibility, full stop. As I said, I, I would have expressed that as part of my presentation, <coughs> maybe not as expressly as that, um, but I would have included the fact that um, that um, limited combustibility is for all of the, the external wall system. It's not um, totally clear in my answer there. Right. Now, we've also just seen the discussion that you had with John Lewis about Brian Martin's answer in June 2015, or lack of answer, to the same question, are cladding panels to be included in 12.7? 12, 12 uh, on that occasion, uh, it looks as if you both decided that regardless of Brian Martin's answer, disappointing though it was to you, the overarching objective was that the external cladding should not provide a medium for fire spread. That's right, I think, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Was that something you were still confident of in, in, in 2016, or had your view begun to uh, soften a little? No, it had not softened. Right. When you responded, why didn't you just tell the audience straight up uh, that, as evidenced by the Dubai cladding fires, which you knew about by that stage at latest, um, ACM panels with a PE core were dangerous and non-compliant and should not be used and should never have been used? As I said, it's probably a badly worded answer. I was trying to express it. Uh, I started off by explaining my understanding of, or I thought I was trying to explain, um, where that uh, the, the misunderstanding came from or the, the, the changes in, in view. Um, I would have, uh, looking at it now, I can't remember actually giving the answer. It's only on reviewing the video. It's a badly worded answer. Um can I just pick something else up in the transcript? Uh, we'll, we'll go to the transcript rather than back to the video. Um, INQ 3014949, page 13. You'll recall the video on it, but, but let's look at the, uh, w the words. Um, if you uh, look at uh, the top of the page, page 13, <clears throat> Uh, I'm so sorry, it's the foot of page 12 is actually where we want to go. Um, if you go to page 12, uh, it says, but the, when we talk to DC, this is towards the bottom of your screen, we have highlighted this with DCLG and they are looking at part B at the moment in terms of looking at other areas of the regulations they need to examine and part B is one of those. We've submitted evidence to say, well, actually, this is something we found as uh, the building control industry. Uh, now, when did you speak to DCLG about that anomaly? Well, we'd spoken to um, Brian Martin. Do you remember speaking? Sorry, I cut you off. I'm so sorry. Sorry, I, 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 um, 
again, again um, I, I can't, I, I, is the email to Brian Martin before this? I'm getting mixed up with the timeline, sorry. You know, the email to Brian Martin was six months before this. So that would have been certainly where we've talked to MHCOG about it. I can't recall if there was a call for evidence at that time either. So when you're referring to talking to DCLG and highlighting the problem with them, is that a reference back to the email exchange that you'd had with Brian Martin in June 2015? It could be. I can't remember any other specific uh, approaches. Whether I, I, I say I'm talking about the building control industry there, it could be that we discussed it at um, BCA meetings uh, and LABC had said they'd raised it or one of the other um, constituent parts of the, of the um, BCA had said that. I don't know. Mm. Uh, in short, was there a, a later discussion about this point between you or anybody else at, at NHBC and Brian Martin between the June of 2015 and January 2016? I can't be certain. Going on in the transcript, just below that, you'll see that you say, um, it, uh, it says, uh, that when you talk to them, it's, you know, yes, you've got a combustible, what could be a combustible cladding, external cladding, but if you then couple that with a combustible or, or an insulation material, which is not a material with limited combustibility, actually you're increasing the risk as well. So that's the, when they developed these regulations after the 1999 fire, that was where the, that came from. Now, the reference to the 1999 fire, is that a reference to the fire at Garnock Court in Irvine in Scotland? I believe so. That had been one of the, um, one of the examples which I think Steve Howard had given at the, uh, at the presentation. Right. What is it that you're trying to, to impart to the audience there when you refer to the, the, that's where that came from? I don't know now. Sorry. Right. And then if you go 13, down, 13 lines down towards the end of the line, um, you, you could see you say, but like other regulations... You see that in the middle of yes, the screen? Yes, But like all regulations, it's they continually evolve when regulations change. We don't revisit older buildings, which perhaps if they were built now we would, wouldn't comply. So we don't do that. So there are a number of areas to the building regulations where there could be buildings out there which wouldn't comply with modern day standards, but those risks are managed, aren't they? So, now when you say those risks are managed, aren't they? How are those risks managed exactly? So, in relation to fire safety, obviously each building has to have a fire risk assessment. So, um, the fire risk assessor, <coughs> as a building owner, you have to commission a fire risk assessment. Um, and you have, as part of that process, um, you highlight any um, challenges with the building. Um, and that, that's, that's any, any building, whether it was built in 1950 or whether it was built five years ago. Um, and you should put in uh, as part of that fire risk assessment, as the owner of the building, you should put in mitigation to manage any risks that are identified. Right. Does that it lead to the inference that a fire risk assessor should know, when conducting a fire risk assessment, that the residential high-rise block he is or she is assessing uh, has an external wall build-up comprising an aluminium composite material panel with a polyethylene core and assess the risk accordingly? I'm not a fire risk assessor and I don't undertake fire risk assessments, so that's something you'd need to... R right. So can you tell me wh when you said but those risks are managed, aren't they? I wasn't just referring to fire safety. I was relating my answer back to fire safety. Mm. but. There are other risks within the building regulations as well, not just fire. And as a building owner, you should be managing those risks. I mean, really what I'm, what I'm getting at is whether your view in January 2016 is whether in relation to the legacy of high-rise residential buildings uh, overclad within ACMP cord panels, um, that problem was not a problem for the building industry or for NHBC or the BCA. Uh, but a problem for the building owner uh, in, in discharge of its obligations under the, the RRO, the Regulatory Reform Order. Any existing building um, is the responsibility of the building owner, isn't it? Now, if the builder owner identifies any risks in that building, 
um, they put measures in. They should be putting measures into place to mitigate that risk. That could be um, going back to their builder if they felt that the builder had done something wrong with that. Was one example of, as you put it, not revisiting older buildings, NHBC's policy of not looking at any of the buildings for which they had approved K15 uh, or other combustible insulation in, in external wall build-ups before January 2014? As I said, I wasn't party to that decision. Understood. But was, was that your understanding, though, at the time, January 16, of NHBC's policy in respect of historic buildings? My understanding was that I was asked to look at the buildings under construction yeah. at that time. Uh, no, I, I appreciate that, and you've made it very clear yesterday and indeed the day before. But, but this is just in relation to the transcript here, and I'm just trying to understand what you're actually referring to. Are you referring to, to that as a policy of NHBC? No. So what are you referring to? I'm referring to the fact that actually there's a number of areas of the building regulations where there could be uh, buildings which don't comply with modern building regulations, and it's up to the building owner to manage those risks not just specifically with fire safety. Now, I want to show you two email runs uh, written about this conference and those comments. Can we go first, first set of email chains, to BLM uh, 50211, please? And I'd like to start on page four uh, with the email at the bottom of page four from Nick Jenkins to you and David Metcalf of CWCT. Uh, and David Metcalf actually makes a later appearance in this. But let's stick with this email. 19th of January 2016 from Nick Jenkins to you. Uh, and it postdates the conference, as you can see from the first paragraph. Uh, and if you look at that first paragraph, he says, I hope this finds you well. You may recall we met last week at the Ciderize BRE facade conference. Steve, after your presentation, I asked some questions of the panel relating to the permissible use of rain screen cladding panels formed from various grades of ACM aluminium composite materials when used as part of multi-layered wall systems. There was some ambiguity in the answers provided by the panel. And let's go on with it. It's a long email, so bear with me. Um, do you remember receiving it? Uh, I do, yes. Yes. I believe this ambiguity stems from some people making the assumption that in the absence of positive test data from BS8414 Part 2 2005 tests featuring ACM sc rain screen panels, that compliance can be achieved for such wall systems featuring by either, one, meeting the guidance given in paragraphs 12.6 to 12.9 of ADB2 by restricting insulation product filler material, not including gasket sealants and similar, etc. Uh, and then he goes on to cite from 12.7. Or providing cladding in accordance with diagram 40, this stipulating that if a boundary exists less than 1,000 millimetres away or, or, and or the building has a height over 18 metres, then a cladding material meeting class nought, national class or B, S3, D2 or better European class is required. And then there's an or, I think, which is straight. And he says this, in my understanding, compliance is not achieved via an if either one or two are satisfied scenario, rather only via an if one and two are both satisfied scenario. In my, if my understanding is correct and the three millimetre thick core associated with four millimetre ACM is to be considered a filler material, then the only ACMs on the market that meet the ADB2 definition of being materials of limited combustibility are Alpolic A2 and Alucabond A2. Both of these products are classified as A2 S1D0 in accordance with BSEN 13501 of 2007. As a rule, in my 15 years' experience of supplying fabricated ACM rain screen panels to specialist cladding contractors in the UK market, we are rarely asked to provide such materials. The vast majority of ACM panels we are asked to provide for architectural application are either Alpolic FR, Alucabon Plus or Larsen FR products, all of which are classified as BS1D0 in accordance with, with uh, BSEN uh, 13501, 2007. And thus, whilst they can be classified as building products that are hard to burn, are not accepted as being a limited combustibility in accordance with Table A7, Appendix A of ADB2. In many instances, it's not e even the BS1D0 rated ACM panels which we are asked to supply, but standard polyethylene core material, ACM, that burns quite efficiently. What's more, I'm aware of many tall residential buildings recently constructed in the UK, 
where such panels are installed in combination with various foil-faced rigid foam thermal insulation boards, which are also not accepted as being of limited combustibility in accordance with Table A7, Appendix A of ADB2. As a responsible supplier, Booth Murray, Euroclad, would like to put a guidance note similar to BCA, TCN, so would be TGN, 18, out to the market, but written specifically in relation to the use of ACM rain screen cladding panels and associated thermal insulation products used as part of a multi-layered build-up wall systems. Before we publish any such guidance, we want to be sure that we have our facts straight. With that in mind, I would very much appreciate your thoughts on my understanding of the current building regulations. Now, um, was there anything about that email that you didn't understand when you received it? Not that I can recall, no. <clears throat> now, if we look up to page two and your response of the 29th of January, we'll see what you say. Uh, for, thank you for your email. But f first, you, know, you note the date. Um, it, it took some 10 days or so to get back to Nick Jenkins. Do you know why? Uh, I think I asked John Lewis to draft me a response. Right. Um, and then if we look at the text of your email, uh, you say, thanks for your, e your email. I've now had the chance to review the contents and comment on the points as below. And if we flip to page three of the email run, NHBC would agree uh, that both points need to be met. Diagram 40 relates solely to the finished external surfaces needing to be cor of the correct surface spread of flame rating, and paragraph 12.7 is an additional requirement for taller buildings where the major components of any external wall system need to be formed from materials of limited combustibility. Like you, I am also unable to see any suggestion that ADB2 suggests that either or is acceptable, and in my view, this doesn't make sense as it implies that SSOF, surface spread of flame, can be used as a trade-off against combustibility. Given that both items aren't closely related, this doesn't make any sense from a fire engineering perspective. And then you go on. NHBC agrees that a Class B product doesn't fall within the classification of a MOLC. As such, it isn't possible to accept the installation of any ACM product on the basis of the recommendations of ADB. However, if the ACM product holds a BS8414 BR135 approval, for the same wall build-up as is being proposed, and it would be deemed acceptable by virtue of the alternative approach stated in paragraph 12.5 of ADB2. However, in NHBC's experience, no such fire tests have been carried out using an ACM material, hence the need to follow BCA Guidance Note 18 as a way to show evidence of compliance with the functional requirement of Regulation B41, which you then set out underneath that. And then at the bottom, if we scroll to the bottom of page 3, in terms of a technical guidance note, NHBC would be happy to comment on any note, and indeed in my capacity as chair of the BCA technical group, would be willing to jointly publish the note as a new BCA guidance note, as I think this would be beneficial to the industry as a whole. Now, um, just pausing there, well, in fact finishing there on that, do you agree that that email is entirely consistent with technical guidance note 18, uh, issue uh, indeed, issue naught and issue one, and with Sarah Colwell's view expressed to you uh, on the 27th of November 2014 at the meeting you had at Watford. Yes, I would. Yes. And do you agree that that is a complete U-turn uh, from what you told the auditorium of industry players only two weeks before? As I said, I think my answer at that uh, was, was badly worded, but that was what I was trying to express. Right. Now, um, David Metcalf uh, was party to this email chain, and we see that if you go back to page uh, two, uh, he has a rather exotic email address. It's abxdwm at bath.ac.uk. Th that's David Metcalf, isn't it? I, 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 if you tell me uh, that's th the case, yes. Right. Uh, well, I <laughs> Sorry, I don't, I don't remember. Uh, no. Everyone's email address, sorry. No, no, fair enough. And if I'm wrong about that, I'll be corrected by somebody. But the, 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 I, I take it from me that that is correct. Okay. Um, had you had a discussion with David Metcalf of CWCT in the interim? No. Did you know what his view was? I didn't know. Why didn't you ask him, do you know? Given that he's I, on the email run. I, I don't know why I didn't. I, my conversation was with Nick. Um, now, let's just go back to the second paragraph of this email, and I want to look at it again. <clears throat> um, 
Yes, if we go back, please, to uh, the second paragraph uh, there. Um, if you agreed that class B was not a material of limited combustibility, and, as you say, there were no large-scale fire tests using an ACM, this is the second paragraph on that page mm. there, how could a builder follow the te BCA technical guidance note to show compliance with B4 other than through a holistic fire-engineered solution? As I say there, a builder would need to go down the BCA guidance note 18. They couldn't use the other route. Well, so they, they could go down the BCA guidance note 18 route. Well, the BCA in, guidance... In terms of, sorry, an option three or option four. But, right, so hmm. not one and two. You, hmm. um, option four, park... Option three, how could a builder follow option three if there were no large-scale fire tests using an ACF <coughs> material generating any test data for the purposes of um, creating a desktop study to approve it? They would have to demonstrate it through other tests that have been un undertaken. But, but on what materials? Uh, it could be a Class B panel like, um, material, for example. Well, a Class B panel could be uh, simply an aluminium panel with no core at all. It could be, yes. Yeah, well, how, how could you use um, a test uh, on that panel uh, to extrapolate across uh, safely to a desktop study which would show um, potential compliance with BR135 in respect of an ACM panel with a PE core? That would be for a, a fire engineer to do in, as part of their report, wasn't it? Well, and for us to review. Uh, uh, it, yeah, it, it, functionally that is correct. But did you have any views at the time about how that would ever pro provide any data which, which could safely be used to produce a desktop study? At this time, we were still, in, yeah, we were, we were still encouraging industry to do tests. So, um, you know, the hope would have been that we we would see a test on a uh, a material which could be, um, you know, which fire engineers could then use. Um, for their option three assessments. Well, if you weren't going to use test data from an ACM panel with a PE core because there, were, there was no such data, did you, did you have in mind what data could be used uh, from which an extrapolation of safety uh, uh, to meet a BR135? Uh, I'd, I'd, from what material? Not at this point. I'm, I'm not a fire engineer. I'm not compiling these reports. I would review, I would review the, the, them as they come through to, to an HPC. Mm. It would be for a fire engineer to gain those reports that they felt could demonstrate compliance. If they were, um, you know, if they were, if they were looking to demonstrate compliance for an ACM material. Did you have any view, one way or the other, about whether any option three desktop reports could ever properly be produced, in, given the absence of data about how ACMPE performed? I didn't have a view on that. No. Right. It, t nonetheless, I, I think, as we can see from this, uh, there were no 8414 tests to BR135 which featured such panels, and such panels couldn't be used because they were not materials of limited combustibility. If you were going down the linear route, uh, option one or option yeah. two. And therefore, it, it comes to this, that leaving aside option four, I think we can leave it like this, uh, that it was desktops or nothing, and you had no view as to whether a desktop uh, which... Uh, would support the use of an ACM panel with a PE core could or couldn't be produced by a fire I, engineer? Again, I would need to review what the fire engineer put forward. Let's go to the second set of emails, uh, NHB 402864. And if you go to the bottom of the email chain, page seven of nine, <clears throat> it's a nine-page email run. Let's go to page seven. First email, Nick Jenkins of Boone Muir to Sarah Colwell of the BRE, 20th of January 2016. So the day after he sent you his email. Uh, and um, uh, the subject heading is uh, use of ACM cladding panels on buildings exceeding 18 metres in height. Uh, it is, take it from me, virtually identical to the email he sent you the previous day. Uh, if we then go up the next email in the chain to page six of nine, we see Nick Jenkins writes to her again on the 1st of February 2016, so about a fortnight later. 
and he says this. Hi, Sarah. Regarding my email of the 20th of January, I received an auto-reply at that time from which I understand you returned to the office last Tuesday. Could you please acknowledge receipt of my query and advise when I could expect to receive a response from the BRE on the matter? I've received feedback from Steve Evans of the NHBC BCA and also David Metcalf of CWCT, who have both confirmed that they think my interpretation of the building regulations in relation to the use of combustible materials in high-rise buildings is correct, i.e. to meet the requirements, paragraphs 12.6 to 12.9 and diagram 40 need to be followed. The question still remains, however, as to which material stroke components have to meet the requirements of paragraph 12.7. Previously, paragraph Previously, para 12.7 was interpreted to mean simply the insulation had to be of limited combustibility, although this was not always adhered to. From recent meetings and discussions, the general understanding is now that the scope of 12.7 extends to also include the external cladding. The BCA guidance agrees with this. David's thoughts are that this is logical, especially following the recent evidence of fire spread up the facade of a number of buildings in the Middle East with combustible cladding panels. A simple read through the approved document, however, would not tell you this. We are, we are waiting feedback and confirmation from the BRE, as this is a perquisite, I think it means prerequisite, to us issuing straight publishing any much-needed guidance note to the industry. Now, uh, it looks as if his reference to your feedback was your email to him of the 29th of January we've just looked at um, on the face of the documents. But can you recall whether you also spoke to Nick Jenkins as well as sending him your email? Uh, I, I don't recall. Now, um, the email run reveals that Nick Jenkins doesn't get an answer from Sarah Colwell and has to chase her. And she, she responds on the 12th of February, if we go to page four. This is now 2016, as I say. Uh, and uh, you can see at the top of the page, uh, a, 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 over, over the top of an email from Nick Jenkins to Brian Martin the same day, 16th of February, um, she says, I'm, I'm so sorry. Um, uh, let, me, let me take this more slowly. Um, if we go, please, down to page four, at the foot of page four, uh, she comes back on the 12th of February and says, Dear Nick, further to my earlier email, we now have a chance to look at your email, and I would suggest that you contact Brian Martin at DCLG, and there's the email address, with regard to this request, as they are the body with responsibility for this document and therefore any interpretations <coughs> associated with it. And then the response from Nick Jenkins is to Brian Martin in the email immediately above that. Hi, Brian, also 16th of February 2016, copy to Sarah Colwell and Stephen Howard of the BRE. I'm forwarding this query to you as recommended by Sarah Colwell of the BRE. As you will note from the correspondence below, Sarah advises the DCLG of the body with responsibility for ADB2. This matter is currently the topic of much discussion in the construction industry, and if one thing is evident, that is, there is much confusion and misunderstanding. Your soonest review of the matter would therefore be most welcome. I look forward to hearing back from you with some clarification. Regards, Nick. And then at the top of the, the page, page four, actually, let's start at the bottom of page three in this email run. Uh, you can see here is Brian Martin's response to Nick Jenkins the same day, 16th of February, 2016, and over the top of page four, please, he says, Hi, Nick, it is for the designer and the building control body to consider if requirement B4 has been met. ADB gives guidance on this by saying that the external wall should not provide a medium for fire spread in tall buildings. It then offers two approaches, a set of rules or a full-scale test. In the rules, we deliberately added the word filler to address things that form part of the cladding system that are not insulation but could provide a medium for fire spread. I think the core of an ACP panel could reasonably be considered to be a filler. So unless the core material meets the rules, then AD suggests a full-scale test. However, if the designer and building control body choose to do something else, then that's up to them. I'm on the road at the moment, so drafting this from memory. Brian. Now, you're not copied in on this email until you're sent it higher up the string a day or two later by Nick Jenkins. That's page one, second email from the bottom. Let's just go to that, if we can, please. Uh, and you'll, you'll see there... Uh, Nick Jenkins passes this on to you, second email from the bottom there, on the 17th of February. You see? Mm. Yes. Um, 
D did you read Brian Martin's email to Nick Jenkins when Nick Jenkins sent it to you the next day? I must have done, but I can't recall reading it. Yeah. Was this the answer that you had been hoping for back in June 2015 when you previously wrote to him on this point? It was, it's still a, a non-answer, though, isn't it? He, he, he still expresses the same view, I think, uh, differently than he put in my email. Um, it's still up to the bill trial body to decide. Now, we then see uh, Nick Jenkins's response at the bottom of page three, if we just scroll back down, which you also saw, because as you, as you can see, you were copied in, uh, uh, and he, uh, not, not to this email, but above it. Uh, and you see that he says to Brian Martin, hi, Brian, many thanks for your response, prompt response. In light of the fires that have taken hold in a number of taken hold of a number of buildings clad in ACM panels in recent years. I also think that the core of ACM panels should most definitely be considered as filler. Some ACM cores meet the rules of ADB, however the ones commonly used in the UK at present don't. To the best of my knowledge, there have been no full-scale 8414 tests carried out to date of any wall constructions featuring any type of ACM panel. I'm aware that two manufacturers of ACM have plans to, t to have such tests carried out. This uh, however, unfortunately means that no existing buildings in the UK over 18 metres tall that feature ACM panels currently meet B4 requirements. There are many such buildings and their numbers are growing. Whilst I appreciate it is for the designer and building control body to consider if requirement B4 has been met, I do think the current situation is of grave concern. Surely this justifies the requirement for a less ambiguous statement of the rules. With the above in mind, do you think it would be worth setting up a meeting with the relevant bodies and experts represented to review the current presentation of the rules? In regards, Nick. Now, I think it was your understanding at this time that there indeed had been no full-scale tests to 8414 using ACM. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, 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 and were you aware of buildings over ACM that had used a ACM, with a, uh, and certainly with a PE core, approved by NHBC, BCS, or I was warranted? Not. I was not. You, were, you weren't. And therefore you would have had no understanding, is this right, of how it came about, if there were such buildings, how they had been approved by NHBC's Building Control Services Division? As I say, I was not aware of any buildings that NHBC had uh, approved on that basis. At this point, were you, did you have any inkling yourself uh, 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 as to whether past approvals of high-rise buildings featuring uh, ACM PE core existed? I was not aware, no. As, as I said, I was, you know, I was confident, as, as far as I could be, that our systems would have picked that up and right. our processes would have picked that up for an HBC building. Mm. Now, here we are in uh, early, early 16. The debate is now raging. I know you say you didn't do it. To your knowledge, did anybody at an HBC uh, think to conduct a retrospective investigation or audit as on how many buildings, if any buildings, uh, in the built environment over 18 metres had been signed off by NHBC's BCS or warranted by NHBC with the build mark warranty uh, featuring ACM and particularly ACM with a PE core as part of the cladding build up? I was not aware, no. No. So you, have, you were aware of no discussions about ha conducting such an exercise, is that, is that right? That's correct. <clears throat> Now, we can see that uh, Nick Jenkins says that the situation is of grave concern. You see those words there. Did you agree with him? I don't know if I'd had a view at that time. I'd say I was, I was looking at this from an NHBC perspective. Well, why would the fact that you were looking at it from an NHBC perspective Be excuse your not having a view one way or the other? Well, no, it, he, he talks about all buildings, again, all buildings that he's been involved with. I, it didn't raise any further concerns with me in terms of our position at NHBC. Well, it, it, that doesn't quite answer my question. You do, it doesn't raise any further concerns. Were your concerns 
grave? Were they serious? It seems that Nick Jenkins's concerns as a supplier were, was that the situation is of grave concern. Did you share his view? I didn't form a view at this time. My, perhaps it's a mistake, but my a lot of my um, attention at this time was really around combustible insulation. Um, as I said, I um, my my feelings in terms of the the work that we've done at um, uh, NHBC would that we would have picked up these had they had that been the case. But you had no basis for that. Um feeling because you hadn't investigated it? No, but our systems would be that our surveyors would review these projects in accordance with the building regulations. Yes, but given the um, anomaly, ambiguity, whichever word you pick, you couldn't be sure that your BCOs on the ground all universally shared your view, Nick Jenkins's view, Sarah Colwell's view. Could you? I couldn't for every one of our surveyors, no. And so... But, I had, to, but I had to have confidence in our processes and the training of our people that that would be the case. But it wasn't part of your process before June 2014 to spell out to BC, your own BCOs uh, that uh, a, an aluminium composite material cladding panel, particularly one with a PE core, uh, could not be used unless it had passed an 8414 test as part of a full-scale test, which none ever had. To the best of my knowledge, we had not done that. No. Um, but I don't. I wasn't involved in every project. No, I'm not suggesting you were. What I'm suggesting to you is that your confidence that your building control officers would have applied ADB in exactly the same way as you were reading it in 2014, 15, 16, and, and, and as you tell us, in fact, historically always, um, given that you couldn't have that confidence... Uh, can you explain why you didn't at least suggest uh, that a retrospective review should be undertaken to make sure that all the building control officers signing off historic projects with this material on it had got it right and not got it wrong? The decision that I had been, had been relayed to me was, was to look at existing building, sorry, not existing was buildings that were under construction. We weren't reviewing um, projects which had been completed. Now let's go to uh, <clears throat> Brian Martin's response, which starts at the bottom of page two uh, at 17th February at 0949, bottom of page two. Uh, and um, he says, thanks, Nick. I'm not sure the text re is really all that ambiguous, given that it must cover all forms of construction. People often argue that it isn't clear when they're trying to justify doing something that's clearly wrong. I'm not entirely sure that even if the ACM products that have flame retardant cores would meet the rules of thumb in, in the AD. So it'll be interesting to see if any of them gets through an 8414 test. But that's just my opinion. We've recently commissioned a survey of Part B users with a view to feeding into the next revision. In the first instance, it might help if you put your views into that, please. And then he gives a link to the survey. There's a meeting of the CWCT group to talk about cladding and fire safety. It's run by Bath University. Maybe you could ask them if you can get involved. Brenda Apted, details below, is organizing things. Now, uh, were you surprised to see that Brian Martin was skeptical of the combustibility of ACM products with flame retardant cores and their ability to pass an 8414 test? I don't know if I had, if that was the case at the time, no, I can't remember. Did you uh, think at that time, did you have a thought at that time uh, that it was possible uh, that building control officers were passing uh, um, build buildings, NHBC buildings, based on option three reports, uh, where the external wall build-up included an ACM core with a, with a 
which was fire retardant. Sorry, ACM with a core which was fire retardant. Uh, I don't know at this time, sorry. Did Brian Martin's response prompt you to... I think the answer is no. D it didn't prompt you to go back and re-review buildings with ACM from the 2015 review that you'd done. No, it didn't. didn't. Why is that? I was confident in the processes we, we'd put in place that whatever the um, external wall construction, um, we would have, been, you know, we would have uh, passed it through our uh, escalation process. No, but, but here you see, for the first time, I, I would suggest, Brian Martin being sceptical uh, about the ability of um, FR called ACM products to um, pass an 8414 test, <coughs> uh, let alone be compliant. It, 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 did that not prompt you to go back and re-review your, your, the, the, or redo the exercise you'd been doing the, the, the previous year, 2015, to look at ACM? No, it didn't. And why is that? Again, I had confidence in the systems that we'd, we'd set up. I did, it didn't... Maybe it's myself in terms of not joining up all the dots. Um, or, but at the time, I was confident that our review had been thorough uh, and that um, those projects that were coming through were being, you know, our teams were all fully aware um, of what they were, what we wanted as NHBC, and those processes would be followed. Now, let's go to the bottom of page one of this email run. There we see Nick Jenkins's response of the 17th of February. Let's look at the first two paragraphs. Uh, he says... Uh, we, we, we're now in the meat of the email. Yes, I think you're probably right uh, in that people are claiming ambiguity to suit their needs. What I can't get my head around, however, is how buildings that clearly include products that neither, one, meet the rules as set out in ADB2, or have been made the subject of a full-scale 8414 test, are achieving building regulation compliance completion certification. Is it that... And he goes on to ask, the certification has been wrongly awarded, thus pointing to a requirement for better informed stroke educated certifying officers, or B, th have they not achieved certification and are thus subject to indemnity policies to cover the risks? Risk. Uh, now, are you able to answer Nick Jenkins's question? I know it wasn't addressed to you, but to Brian Martin, but if it had been asked to you, what would you have said? <clears throat> Sorry, can I take a short break? On well, we could have a break yeah. for lunch and in the event you'd like to. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. let's, let's I think we'll do that, Mr. Minnick. Yes. We can come back to this at a later stage. Um, Right, we'll stop now for lunch then, Mr. Evans. We'll resume at two o'clock, please. And um, again, please don't discuss no, your evidence with anyone outside the room. Thank you. Right, thank you very much, Mr. Millett. Two o'clock, please. Thank you. <clears throat>